today. To, of course, to my boss, Mr. Kelly Kinitik and Asik Alvi Navarro. Our distinguished panel of judges, good afternoon. Uh, Ms. Diane uh, says, Carlo, James, Abe, and Arup, uh, colleagues from the government, uh, to the participants who are in the Axel events now, and most especially to our national finalists. I'm sure you're already excited uh, to present. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So thank you all for joining us today as we conduct the national finals of the Philippine Startup Challenge 2021 professional category. So I would like to ask if uh, my uh, presentation can be shared now. It's just going to be very quick. I'm just going to share with you the Philippine Startup Challenge journey since we started what in 2014 over there. Okay, so um, the Philippine Startup Challenge is one of the major initiatives of the DICT. In fact, we have started doing this in 2014. And the goal is to be able to encourage Filipinos, uh, students from all over the country, especially in the countryside, to create, develop ideas that will actually help solve social problems using technology or ICT. So uh, today we are going to have the Philippine Startup Challenge finals for the professional category. In fact, uh, can we go to the next slide, please? Earlier, if you've uh, heard about my presentation about the Digital Startup Development and Acceleration Program. So uh, this uh, component is under the End of Nation Network. And again, the goal is to be able, as, as you can see there, uh, to encourage Filipinos to create innovative and relevant ICT products and services that will help solve social problems. And we're actually very grateful that over the years, uh, Ms. Diane and Arup and Cess, who are here with us, have been with us since we started doing this in 2014, when we were still Department of Science and Technology, Information and Communications Technology Office. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So here, so this is the journey since we started this in 2014 and moving forward. So we're able to engage, encourage 439 schools that participated in the Philippines Startup Challenge and um, as you can see, 1,200 plus teachers have actually been involved being the mentors for those students that participated in the challenge. And we were able to receive 765 total startup entries. And uh, for this year, if we can go to the next slide, so ganyan na po kadami no, yung nag-participate because again, the goal is to be able to encourage the students, the individuals, not only in Metro Manila, but the in in the countryside, of course, because we want the program to be really inclusive. So for this year, this is our sixth year. And for this year, this is the first time that we have actually included one category, which is the, for the professional category. For the many past years, for the past five years, we have only uh, actually invited, involved college students. But now it's open to professionals and for the student category, uh, we're also open not only for the fourth year college students, but also including senior high school students. So for the professional category, uh, the five winners, meaning the top five, will be eligible <clears throat> to receive our DICT strength startup grant fund amounting to 500,000 uh, pesos so that we'll be able to help uh, the top five to be able for them you not know, to, to improve and be able to be at least successful in their uh, startup journey. And aside from the grant from the DICT, uh, they will be receiving uh, prizes from our sponsors and partners in terms of uh, mentorship, uh, cloud vouchers, gadgets, and other uh, equipment. And of course, including trophies and certificates. Okay, can we go to the next slide? So this is the, the, the journey or the process. And uh, for this year, so we started doing the call for application and the announcement. And for them to participate for the regional competition. Oh, by the way, the, the difference from the previous years is that all the entries were submitted directly to the national. But this year, for us to be more inclusive, we have actually involved our regional offices or clusters through the regional uh, pitching competition. So from there, uh, uh, from the regional competition, um, we had the screening of entries. And then, uh, so 
two weeks ago, we had the regional pitching competition of our 16 regions. And from there, we're able to have the top one winners. And then for the top two and three winners, we had our semifinals uh, last week. And there, um, so right now, uh, we are now in the uh, finals, uh, national finals. And later on, we are going to announce the top five winners uh, among the top 25 uh, winners that we will be judged by our judges. Next slide, please. Okay, so uh, this is the, the timeline, the journey. So we started this in July, uh, accepting applications until August. And then we had a screening, pre screening process in September. And then uh, last October, we, we had our regional pitching competition from the different cluster offices. And then uh, last week, we had our semifinals. And now we are doing the national finals. Can we go to the next slide, please? Okay, so uh, for this year, uh, we were able to receive uh, 121 entries from 121 teams, and uh, we were able to conduct that 16 uh, regional pitching competitions, and 16 teams actually advanced to the finals, and then last week, as I mentioned, uh, we chose nine from the 27 second and third regional finalists. So today, we are going to have the 25 national finalists. Okay, next slide, please. All right, so as I mentioned, uh, last November 10, um, we had that semifinals where we chose nine uh, winners from the 27 uh, second and third regional finalists, which uh, made them now part of the national finals. Okay, next slide, please. So these are the criteria for the uh, judging. So. Uh, viability in terms of relevance, creativity, and presentation. So, yeah, can we go to the next slide, please? Okay. So before um, uh, before we we go to the to the pitching now, I would just like to invite everyone because uh, for the student category, the application still open until December thirty. So uh, for those uh, uh, representatives or participants from the academy would like to invite you to participate in the Philippine Startup Challenge for the student category, which will actually end uh, on December 30 for the application of entries, submission of entries, because we'll have the regional pitching in January, and then the semifinals and national finals will be done in February 2022. Okay, I think this is my last slide, but yeah, before, um, can we go to the next slide? We'd like to thank, it's basically thanking our startup uh, community partners. Uh, next slide, please. All right, so these are our community partners uh, in the implementation of our, not only of the Philippine Startup Challenge, but all the digital startup development and acceleration program of the ICT. And we hope to invite more partners and collaborators to join us in really uh, pushing for a very vibrant Philippine startup ecosystem. So with that, thank you so much again. Uh, good luck to our finalists. And once again, thank you to, all, to our judges. So yeah, let's do it. Thank you, thank you. Thank you very much, Thank Director Emmy. The, the Philippine Startup Challenge, Challenge has really gone, has really far, gone far from how it was, from conducted, how it was before. conducted before, and we're, and we're continuously improving our startup our support startup activities support to guide activities our Filipino, Filipino startups, startups and contribute, and to, the and contribute to the growing Philippine startup, startup ecosystem. ecosystem. At this point, At this let, point us let us now introduce our judges, our judges for the national, for the national finals. finals. First, first, we have a member of the Manila Angel Investors Network, or MAIN, the largest the private, investors, private investors, investors network in the network Philippines, in the may, Philippines. We introduce may we introduce Mr. James Lett as, as the former executive director of Maine. He, he has syndicated over 2 million US, US dollars in seed investment across, across 15 startups in, in the last 12 months and grown Maine to, to, Maine to a network of over 100 NHWI investing in the Philippines. Next, we have a judge who is a passionate about social change.
founder and CEO of Impact Hub Manila, Mrs. Rondario, a motivated serial social entrepreneur with extensive experience in program development and ecosystem building. Her company, Impact Hub Manila, aims to catalyze purpose-driven entrepreneurs to use their enterprises as vehicles for social change. We also have an advocate for the business integrity and great believer for the push for economic complexity and the need for more businesses and Filipino entrepreneurs. May we welcome the former executive director of an accelerator for tech startups, Idea Space Foundation, Ms. Diane Eustachio. She prides herself in the fact of having a hand in each of the 107 startups that went through the Idea Space Fund programs and engaging with over 400 entrepreneurs in the year she was with the foundation. Next, we have an award-winning social entrepreneur who is founding partner of Core Capital, which invests in the next generation of the Philippine's most promising startup. May we introduce Mr. Carlo Delantar, who is the head circular economy of Gobi Partners and leads investment in innovative companies that champion sustainability. We also have the general manager of Launch Garage, a premier startup accelerator in the Philippines and core enabler of the Philippine startup ecosystem through the, its grassroots development programs. Let us welcome Mr. Ive Losada. Who is currently tech? Who is currently the ventures of Plug and Play Tech Check Center (APAC) for the Philippines? Plug and Play Tech Center is the largest open corporate innovation platform and one of the most active early stage investors globally. Last but not the least, we have a serial serial entrepreneur working on making technology work for businesses to make life better for everyone it touches. The founder, president, and CEO of a software product engineering company that works with software companies across the world doing research development of their intellectual property. Let us welcome Mr. Arup Meiti of Last Asia. Now that we have introduced the six judges who will decide the winners for this year's Philippine Startup Challenge in the professional category, may we ask the judges to turn on their cameras for a short photo off with our DICT officials. about to open the final pitching session. May I remind again that top 25 startup teams and our judges of the following reminders. For our finalists, we ask you to follow the naming convention for this event. And then for our judges to ensure the smooth flow of the program, we would like to ask you to use the raise hand function in the Zoom to be acknowledged before you ask the startup teams during the five minute question and answer portion. With that, we are now ready for the final pitching proper. Let us welcome our finalists in the professional category of the Philippine Startup Challenge 2021. Is everyone excited? Let us know your comment to our viewers in the Excel events. You may as well start place your bet. To everyone, good luck. Now, let us proceed with the first team. May we have the video pitch of the internet tonight, Tito. Hello, DSET. Thank you so much for your time and thank you for this opportunity. My name is Kyle, along with my partner, Angel. We spent our lives working in media, working with the government and building communities. A quick history lesson, what I'm presenting to you today is a rebirth and an evolution of a show I used to handle on Net25 called Convergence. I'm hoping you were watching the show back then too. Now our problem is PH startups still don't have enough attention in 2021. We deserve more of it. And our neighbors are already doing it for their own startups. Singapore, Indonesia, Thailand, and Hong Kong and China, as you can see on your screen, they already have media properties specifically supporting startups. 
Now, what I'm offering to you today is something we can do better and dream bigger with in the Philippines, and I call it the Internet Tonight. Now, here are some features of the Internet Tonight, and you can see it on your phone. But first, our mission and vision is keeping Filipinos in the know on what's happening and why it matters in tech. I'd love for you to visit our website, www.theinternettonight.com. I would be honored if you would be part, part of our first group of subscribers and everything that you will see on www.theinternettonight.com in 2021 and beyond will be built on this tech stack that you can see here on your screen. Now, this is what the market is worth. The TAM is 550 billion pesos almost for all of Southeast Asia. In the Philippines specifically, it's about 63 billion pesos. And in terms of video, it's almost 6 billion pesos. But I leave a question mark here because those figures do not include new generating opportunities in subscriptions, memberships, and yes, the buzzword NFTs. And I'm sure you've heard of that with Axie Infinity, where people making money and playing games, playing to earn. Now, I think we're just in the first quarter of NFT, of this NFT game that's right now it's built for scarcity and playing games. But in the same way that the iPhone 1 is not like the iPhone 13, there will be uh, evolution of NFTs and NFTs 2.0, I think, will be built for utility and we can do this. And big picture is that NFT 2.0 in the future will be like a sort of digital passport to new media opportunities for accessing events, for getting rewards, for sharing and earning, for sharing and earning, that's, that's an amazing opportunity. And this is our timeline. We launched with our partners January 3, 2022. In the second and third, third quarters there, you can see we're opening up memberships and subscriptions. And by January 1, 2023, with your support, we're hoping to launch our first NFTs. Now, what happens with your support? 100,000 of that goes back to existing PH startups that the DICT already supports as well. And 400,000 will be for job creation. Little picture is we're challenging norms. The big picture here that I hope you'll join us with is creating new norms. And I'm hoping we can begin that around the world here at home in the Philippines. This is our little studio. I hope when COVID goes away and we're back to a new normal, you can join me there. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Team Tito. We will now open the five-minute question and answer portion for the Team Tito. Uh, may I ask the judge? Hello. I only, judge we only Aru? get five minutes? Yeah, we only have five minutes, sir. <laughs> okay, great. Hello, Judge Arab. I, I, I'm just trying to understand a little bit. Uh, I... I it started and it made sense for a while, but then you lost me at NFT. Um, sure. I mean, you know, I, I, I see the potential of um, like a show that runs, that highlights the startup and tech and all, and that's great. And I understand the whole NFT side of the game, but I lost it somewhere. How does it connect and what does it do? So if I could just repeat your question, there, you get the show. Um, in terms of, let's say, in the, in the, at the end of the, my pitch, I said we're challenging uh, norms. Um, the first part of the show is, you know, we're challenging display advertising, uh, pop-ups and cookie notices. Uh, we're hoping to do that with memberships and sponsorships. Uh, but there's more to that, right? And I think NFTs are the next stage. We've seen the New York Times, even the South China Morning Post selling NFTs of, of their headlines because uh, they're scarce. Um, and the big media companies have already done this. I think the next stage is when those NFTs transform into something more than just a token for scarcity. Uh, we can, they're composable, they're reprogrammable. We can say, if you own this NFT, you can attend this event. Um, and it's already happening already around the world in, in some Japanese publications that are a little too intricate. But it works as us, the NFT that you have of the internet tonight, for example, you being uh, an owner of our community. Uh, and we're doing that later in the game because like every other startup in this competition and all others, the problem that we're all going to have is distribution. Uh, but we're, as a media company, we have a little bit less of that problem, especially if you read my application. Uh, we do have broadcast media partnerships. Hold on. So, um, so I, okay. So if, if NFT is a future thing, I'll just remove it from my mind for now. Uh, okay. Now going back to the main offer, what you're saying. So you're going to be like an E27 on video is it yes right 
video you know, podcast you know, videos and uh, who who subscribe the one who's going to listen to it or the startups are going to subscribe to it why not both um it it's it's supposed to be infotainment in a sense uh kind of like what techcrunch does with some of their specifically targeted uh video and spotify uh, sp- uh audio uh program offerings um we are working with traditional broadcast so there's a little bit of having to please a large set of people and of course having to please us 25 uh, uh, startups here for example i'm good with that i let the other judges ask thank you thank you judge thank you judge haru now we will proceed to judge james sir james hi i've seen um, you around sir. before hi james hi there i got a quick question why do you need to raise revenue to start getting traction on this this seems like something you know having podcasts doing some channels it doesn't have a cost so what what are you raising the money for well we are still a company and the way that i've set up our partnerships with our uh, broadcast uh partners i still have to produce the show um and i still have to eat dinner <laughs> and get around and maybe meet you in your office at main or something um and, and as a new media company we do have that advantage of uh partnering with our broadcast partners that we're not starting from scratch we can hit the ground running uh but i'd like to take care of the brand first without selling out with too many ads i want to be able to gain james's trust uh and his attention um and and throwing an ad in front of you or a sponsorship in front of you right away uh keeps me away from getting there uh as i'd like to so are you going to be broadcasting 8 hours a day or working it has a day or i would be yeah uh but the show you'd catch it uh every night ideally at 10 p.m. um and of course uh throughout the day maybe on the radio i can't necessarily say this is being recorded and i can't necessarily say who my partners are but if you look closely into the pitch uh, you'll see who i'm working with it's okay i'm um, diana let you have a, a few questions thank, thank you, you james thank you very much thank you very much judge james now we will proceed to judge diana I'm Diane. Hello, Judge Diane. Hi. Um, I'd like to understand your Tam Sam song and where did you get those numbers? Uh, I got those numbers from. Oh, I'm running out of time. Uh, specifically, uh, thinkwithgoogle.com/slash/international/tools/resources/research/studies economies uh, Southeast Asia 2018. <laughs> That's okay. 2018. So It's 2021, so the numbers are larger. I want to understand your song particularly. So mm-hmm. who are your customers and how are you going to get them into watching your channel? Uh our customers are actually as I mentioned earlier in the pitch deck we I handle the show called Convergence. Um they were people who were interested in technology like myself who were able to watch it on free TV without data. Uh, but it's 2021 now, so we can make use of both broadcast and digital working together. There's nothing like that in the Philippines. Um, there's uh, like print journalism, but they're not on television, and they don't do it as well. Um, same thing with Rappler. At the, the, the closest thing that we have tonight, uh, not tonight, today is the final pitch. But that's more of like a episodic TV series and less of a magazine news program that you watch every day. With the final pitch, I have to watch how many episodes to find out who the winner is. Um, with the internet tonight, we find one winner every week. If it's us or Vea or um, another startup, we feature them. It's it's you and me, I guess. I mean, I I understand it's difficult to pick it up that way, but. uh the the broadcast and the digital helps us to reach a larger segment of people without us having to start from scratch and i have a lot of experience in media so we're hoping to be able to push that okay oh by answer to question <laughs> thank you very much that will be the last question for the thank you team tito very much team tito now we will proceed to the next speech uh for team bea yeah The Philippines has seen an unprecedented rate of adoption of remote working and remote learning practices within the past year. Online platforms such as Zoom and Google Meet have been used for synchronous collaboration, including meetings and webinars. Organizations that conduct events physically were forced into the digital space, and current platforms do not meet the desired event needs completely or are too expensive. They opt to use multiple applications in order to complete the experience, but fall short on making it whole. 
we plan to solve that problem. The virtual event industry is growing at a 22% per year and is expected to reach 86.37 billion by the end of 2021. 45% of that industry includes the professional and education sector. VIA is able to help organizations, companies, and institutions host their events in a unified, simplified, and affordable way. VIA is short for the virtual event app. It is a software service catered to organizations that want to host their events in a single platform. We complete the virtual event experience from registration to evaluation, integrate with different services such as Zoom for streaming, PayMongo for payments, among other features listed here in this slide. Here is an example of our event lobby. You can see different venues here, such as the auditorium for live and recorded broadcasts, a networking lounge for your attendees, a sponsor, exhibit booth, and even a place for your scientific poster presentations. VIA can be easily customized to fit your event needs, but don't just take my word for it. Here are some of our happy clients for their local and international conferences. Over the past uh, six months from inception to market, we have had 850,000 pesos in sales, and that is just for three paying clients. Should we qualify for the Philippine Startup Grant, we will use it for more product R&D and in exploring new markets, and perhaps even an official launch, of course, through our platform, VIA. Again, uh, hosting virtual events is hard, but doesn't have to be. Let VIA simplify your virtual event experience, and we'd be glad to have you on board. Thank you, and good day. Thank you very much, Team VIA. Now we will now uh, proceed with a question and answer. Yes? Good afternoon, everyone. Hi, uh, I'll start. So, okay, thank you, sir. Uh, I have seen a lot of similar platforms, and in the last last two years, it has like mushroomed like anything, right? So, what's your differentiation? What is your differentiator? Like, why would someone choose this one versus the Axel event or others? Great. Uh, thank you for asking that question. In fact. Um, the, the main uh, reason why we built VEA is because although there are different platforms that already exist, such as, for example, those recently acquired by Hopin, which is Attendify, um, are, are quite costly. And if you take a look at the pricing scheme, uh, the customizations that you will be able to uh, do in those platforms to customize it for a certain type of event are quite costly also. Uh, when we built this platform, we started it as a product for a certain organization, professional academic organization, and they had certain needs uh, that we wanted to address. And at the same time, while building this product for that, we figured we could create this into a full product and service. And so what we did was actually build the platform. It runs on an API. It has a library of different front-end uh, services as well as different types of endpoint integrations to different services as well. So, what so we basically provide. it's more economical and it's more configurable. Yes, uh, and agile if we configure it to certain events. So say for example, you want it virtual, we could find a different front end virtual 3D uh, front end, uh, but it runs on a, the same platform on the back end. Other question from the judges? There's none? Yeah, so who are your customers? Okay. Uh, yeah, um, for those three past customers for the past six months, those are actually uh, academic and professional organizations. One of the most uh, major org is uh, the Philippine Society for Microbiology. We held their three-day event uh, for their national scientific convention and um, uh, uh, international event, actually. So it, it had both international and local counterparts. The same thing with the other customer, which is the biology Teachers Association of the Philippines, which also had, you know, uh, international attendees there. Our most recent one was the Philippine Society for Cell Biology, 
And so if you noticed our niche, uh, we started our beachhead with with professional and academic organizations. And that's because mm-hmm. these were the organizations that conducted a lot of events uh, during this early period because of, you know, of the pandemic and because of it's related to the medical sector and research. Mm-hmm. How big is that market? Um, looking at uh, the number, there is actually no, no known market in the Philippines. Uh, what we have in the numbers that we presented in the presentation is an international one. And um, we are actually also having a little bit of hard time finding out the actual uh, full demand for that uh, market and industry. But it's about 42% based on you know private uh, studies. But we're looking into, that's why we wanted to go into this grant, is to do a little bit more of the market study and figure out where to narrow down, where our services may be able to thrive for. Thank you, Ma'am Dayan. Question, Ma'am says. Hi. So I'm a I'm a market. I recently licensed an international group. Can you dis- Are you able to disclose how much you charge for the three day? Let's take the average cost. Sure. Yeah. Um. For a three day event, uh, it it really depends also, of course, on the number of attendees or participants in streaming hours. But we average of about uh one hundred uh thousand per day. But that also includes. Um, uh, about a month worth of streaming, uh, a lot of data, you know, for example, poster presentations take up a lot of memory uh, and streaming time because scientific posters have a lot of, uh, you know, they demand a lot of data. Plus, of course, the streaming and the video. So uh, we're roughly at around 100,000 per day, but we wanted to narrow it down also with uh, a little bit more research. Well, that's, well, that's, that's actually pretty cheap. So, but the Includes the customization and all of that, the lobby design. Do you do the design in house, or do you do you have your do you have the that does the client need to do that themselves? Yeah, um, what we did with our first prototype is have the client uh, find their own images. But right now, we're already partnering with certain organizations to do customization for, say, for a lobby uh, that can be. Uh, have templated uh, designs. Well, I have templated designs. Uh, we do have. Pero very default pa lang, parang just two, two templates. And um, of course, some organizations don't fit in that template. Okay. Yeah. But it's 100,000 a day. So, pesos? Pesos, pesos. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ma'am Seth. That will be the last questions for the team there. Yeah? Thank you very much. Okay. Now we will proceed to the next team. Please welcome the video page of. Team Peace Saver. Peace Saver. Hi everyone, I'm Kim, and I'm one of the co-founders of Peace Saver, a startup that aims to help reduce food waste in the Philippines. One third of all the food produced globally is wasted every year. That's right, one third. And just to be clear, when we talk about food waste, we're talking about perfectly good food. Something that you and I would buy at a market or restaurant, yet these are being thrown away in unimaginable quantities every single day. In fact, it's so much that if the global food waste were a country, it would be the third largest greenhouse gas emitter after the US and China. Approximately 800,000 tons of food are wasted every year in Metro Manila alone, and about 40% of food waste occurs in food service related businesses. It's a colossal amount of food wasted, despite the fact that about two out of three Filipino households are considered food insecure or lacking reliable access to nutritious food. On a more personal note, as a kid, my mother grew up in a food insecure household. My grandmother would sell fish in the wet market, and my mom, starting at the age of seven, would rush to the market right after school to help sell fish in the jeepney and bus terminals nearby. They were selling food that they couldn't afford to eat themselves. Unfortunately, this is a classic example of the harsh realities currently faced by millions in our own country, and this has only been exacerbated by the global pandemic. So when I heard about food rescue apps becoming increasingly popular in many parts of the world, I thought, wouldn't it be amazing if we had something like this in the Philippines? Fast forward to February this year, and Saver was born. Saver is the Philippines' first sustainable food app that allows people to rescue perfectly good food from being thrown away. We're currently being incubated at the Make Sense Academy, and we recently won the People's Choice Award at the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations Asia-Pacific Innovation Challenge at the World Food Forum. What we do is we partner up with food and beverage establishments and local farms who upload their special offers online. So in the app, 
you and I would be able to find great discounts on food like bread and pastries and oversupply, or produce which may look just a little too crooked for usual go-to supermarkets. We actually chose to use the term feast to adhere to the mindset that food should be appreciated and even celebrated, because a small or simple meal for some could be a feast for many. In terms of our business model, FeeSaver will take a percentage commission on successful transaction, a model that's been appealing to large and small merchants alike. Our team is composed of three members with a range of complementary skill sets within business development, strategy, technology, and more to make this into a reality and a success. The DICD startup grant would allow us to allocate more resources towards improving the product as well as increasing awareness about the food waste problem as well as FeeSaver's part in solving it. We see Fee Saver as a great way for all parties involved to embrace a truly sustainable strategy, and we are so excited to make this into a reality. And with that said, let us not let perfectly good food go to waste. Be a Fee Saver. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Team Fee Saver. Now we will proceed to the question and answer. Sir James, for the first question. Yeah, thank you. Um... Love the mission. I've just got a couple of questions on your model. Do you do you hold the stock? So who's taking the risk on the purchases, um, and who's delivering? Who have so you outsourced that? Yeah, we're not taking any stock. We're simply just connecting the merchants with the customers. So the payment just goes through us, but it's actually the merchant that fulfills um, the the sale. And right now, we're only doing pickup at the store, which also aligns with our sustainability um, angle. But of course, if, it, if customers would like to have it delivered, they can book a courier themselves. Okay. And do you, to get the discount, do you guarantee a certain um, order flow, or is it more that, the, that they see the social impact so that they, they offer that discount? Um, it's, sorry, could you uh, repeat the question? Do you? You're getting a discount from some of the providers. Are you getting that because you're offering them a certain uh, volume of orders or is it more that they, they like the mission that you have? It's more the latter. Um, and it's also a problem that we see um, when, when we speak to the merchants themselves, they do have this oversupply. So they like selling it for the cost, but of course they also like to, to get something. They want to recover some costs from having this oversupply because otherwise they would throw it away. Thank you very much, Sir James. Now for the next question, Mom Diane. Yeah. Hi. Uh, you're working in a very fragmented uh, uh, environment. How do you intend to decrease the variability and um, manage costs? So fortunately, we are able to build all of um, our build our product in house, um, that, and that has really certainly helped us keep our costs down. Um, so far, actually, we only um, had our costs on the registration of, of our startup, and fortunately, that's been um, that's been really able to to help us um, continue um, without. I mean, continue this without um, having too much costs and and burning our 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 run yeah yeah that's as far as your startup is concerned but the market that you're dealing with is is a very fragmented situation right and isn't there variability that uh, you have to deal with from day to day given it is um you have to deal with perishables yeah, so we actually have a customer app and a merchant app the merchant app um gives the merchant the power to put up offers um whenever there's there's any basically so if they want to actually um let's say they have 10 pastries up for sale three of those got sold in the store and there's seven left they can just upload that um immediately so it's automatically uploaded they can even change the discounts and increase the discounts as the higher the risk of the food being thrown away so we made sure to give that power to the merchants so that we can really rescue food quickly um, we they don't have to reach out to us to change anything actually. Mm, it's interesting how the merchant still has time to do that, uh, well, given the well, many things they have to attend to. 
Yes, we, we tell them that if they can allot um, the sales towards the end of the day, um, then that would be, I guess, the most effective for them because we, of course, understand that these are discounted products and so they would offer less of their times. So we, we also took that into account when we were building the app. Thank you very much, Ma'am Diane. It's your turn, Sir Aru. Yeah, I'm trying to understand how you're going to compete with uh, Food Panda and Grab tomorrow, adding this feature to their app where they can just, you know, apply a discount feature. Yeah, so we actually get this uh, question quite a bit, but we don't see um, them uh, competing with us. We don't because. Uh, partly because there's not so much, I guess, not as much money uh, in it to begin, uh, I mean, um, for them. Um, and what we think is also exciting with VSaver is that the, the offers would change every day because we don't know what oversupply there will be. Um, and that's why we think it's exciting for the customers because let's say there would be bread and pastries today near your area, tomorrow there could be something else. So there's that excitement. It's not the regular offerings that you will see like you would see in the other um, food apps right th um, out there. Thank you very much, Sir Aru. Additional question from the other judges? Okay, Amam says... Hi, um, so I, I, I don't know if I missed it, but I just checked your pitch deck and uh, you said you were running on commission. How much commission are you on average? Have you factored we're, in? We're looking at 15 to 20%. And okay. this is also, this follows a similar model for other food waste apps um, existing in Europe and the US as well. They charge 15 to 20%. Okay, I don't know if I missed it also, but have you tested this with the merchants and um did they give you any feedback on the the margin that, that you're putting yeah so far we've tried our our early launch a few weeks ago and and those three merchants are have agreed with the with our commission rate and it's the it's the logistics here so you're handling the the delivery right no we don't handle any of that the payment only goes through us and it's the merchant that fulfills um i yeah. mean the customer goes to the store they provide it there Ah, they, so it, ah, okay. Hmm, interesting. So, yeah, so we just connect them. Okay. Okay, I'd be curious to find out how the experience on the customer end will be, right? So, but okay. Okay, thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Team C. The big, big feature of Team Arts. Hello, I'm Kevin Philip Gaia of IOL, the proponent of the Advanced Robust Cooperative System, or ARCS, an integrated software as a service solution, or SaaS, for cooperative management and compliance. In 2019, cooperative membership reached 11.6 million. Co ops nationwide provide employment to more than half a million Filipinos, and these co ops are collectively managing assets worth half a trillion pesos. However, 36% of these co-ops are non-reporting. With these numbers, there is no question that the co-op sector is booming and has a lot of room to grow. However, they are being plagued by non-compliance, inefficient manual processes, and relatively poor financial risk management compared to financial institutions. So what's the potential of this market? There are over 18,000 co-ops in the Philippines in 2019. Of the total co-ops in the country, more than 3,000 are located within our area of operations. In three years, we endeavor to have 10% share of the total market or around 1,800 co-ops onboarded on the platform. We know the economic benefits of having web-based solutions in the operations of a co-op, especially now with the ongoing pandemic. This belief was further strengthened by our interviews and interactions with cooperative officers. Thus, we thought of building an integrated platform for co-ops using a modern SaaS architecture on AWS, the first of its kind in the co-op sector. Some of the core features of the ARCs are the membership database, loan module, election module, cooperative multi-user management, accounting and financial reporting, HR system, and member financial transactions. All of this on a single web and mobile application. We also plan to integrate machine learning powered features, including a credit scoring service 
and cooperative financial risk assessment. We have already built the basic features or services for the system and established partnerships with AWS, a digital cop, and a payment gateway. We are also currently conducting a cooperative needs analysis to further understand the needs of these co-ops. Early next year, we will strengthen our partnerships and begin user beta testing in preparation for an aggressive marketing and onboarding campaign. As with other startups, we expect to generate revenue only after some time. Although we expect modest revenues next year, significant growth is projected in 2023 and 2024. The cost for next year until 2024 is expected to reach 9 million pesos. More than half will be spent on systems development, 20% on equipment outlay, and the remaining budget will be spent for marketing, administration, and operations. Thank you for listening. And if you are interested in working with us, you may contact us via email at kevin at iolph.com. For funding, and um, I think you are uh, benefiting from that. How? Why would you need additional funding from the ICT? Yeah. Um. Thank you, Ma'am Ryan. Uh, it's actually more of getting more, uh, expanding our network. Um, it's it's a it's a means for us to also tap into the other uh, government offices to ask for their help. So uh, we're, it's, it's not really more of us get wanting to get additional grants. It's really more of us getting wanting to um, get, or getting more support from other government agencies because given the tasks at hand, it would be uh, challenging and we want to get as many partners as possible. And the ICT is one that I believe would be very much uh, helpful in our, um, given their infrastructure. Wouldn't the CDA be the most appropriate government agency to connect to, or to which which government agency would be more closer to the CDA than yeah. the ICT? Yeah, we we are currently working with the CDA as well, uh, the local office of the CDA. We've been uh, working with them, and uh, we're just in the process of making sure that the uh, the the core features are now available. For our uh, for the local co-ops here in Baguio City, so um, as with regards to uh, the CDA, so that uh, we're just in the process of drafting the MOA. So we, we're we're working with them. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, Sir Arif, you have question, Pa. Uh, I'm trying to understand basically this um, online accounting system with a loan management feature is that correct uh it's just it's more than just an accounting system it's really more uh, of um, uh, regulatory technologies uh, which includes uh, accounting system and the different um uh, systems as well integrated in one single platform so we have hr reporting systems etc so um yeah so but but it's tailored for the cooperative industry what is the pain of the co-ops today? Are they aware of the pain? Are they looking for solving it? Yeah. So based on our second survey, so we did two surveys already, and um, it's really a pain for them. Um, it's a pain point for them to prepare reporting. And I think this is also one of the reasons why there are a lot of co-ops that, that doesn't really, um, that, 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 that's having difficulties growing because they're mostly manual. And if you look at the solutions available on the market right now, they're mostly legacy tech. So they're not SaaS. So you have to pay um, upfront for the development or- How much will it cost? Yes. Uh, How yes, much sir? will it cost to use your SaaS? Yeah. 
So we'll be doing a freemium model. So for small and micro cops, it will be free, up to 100 members. Uh, for uh, the higher tiers, those uh, with additional uh, premium services, it would be at four nine ninety per month. Will you break even? Um, as of right now, honestly, we haven't uh, done the computations yet because uh, we're still filling the market. But that's our initial computations. But uh, we're looking at uh, breaking even and changing possibly our pricing by 2023. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, additional question from the judges? Okay, if there's none, thank you very much. The page of Team Roborent. Zach's and Roborent. Problem with contagion, hazards, or labor issues. At the hospital, restaurant, hotel, event, mall, or office. The solution? Zaxxon and robots. Robots don't sneeze. RoboRent is applicable for a wide range of establishments. We customize and build your robot according to your needs. RoboRent for your intended use, core specs and accessories. Robots made in the Philippines. Or rent or rent to own your own robot server or arm. The cost of our robot is 10% that of human labor. Robots are consistent in the task they are programmed to do. Our robots are cheaper than traditional robots and involves less contact. Other robots involve multiple touch points for staff and customer on touchscreen and components. Zaxxon Robot has only one touch point. So far Zaxxon Robots have drawn interest from investors, hospitals, franchise chain. Media agencies have featured Zaxxon. One client for Zaxxon contactless solutions is Duncan, where Zaxxon introduced the auto door to reduce contact. Competitor Robots requires the staff and customer to touch its components. Zaxxon Robot has only one touch point for the staff and zero touch point for the customer. We validated the robot use at our own Zaxxon Robot Cafe in Metro Baguio. Robots bring joy and new futuristic experience to customers. Having a robot at your establishments attracts more customers, increases sales and also saves our employees time. At hospitals, food and medicine can be delivered without exposing healthcare workers to highly contagious patients reducing mortality rate. Or have a tele-present doctor for communication. Or a disinfection option as a robot accessory. At hotels, robots can augment employees so staff can focus on more important and creative tasks. RoboRent is a contactless robotic restaurant system mitigating risk of infection by reducing touch points from ordering, food preparation and delivery. Robots can work in harmony with humans and collaborate with employees. Applicable in restaurants, hotels or hospitals not by replacing humans but by helping them. Robotics is a big industry globally that the Philippines should catch up in. Funding can help build robotics industry in the Philippines. Funding received will be allotted for product development and the team composed of robot engineers. Need a robot? Ask Zaxxon. Proceed to the question and answer. Afternoon. Hi. Hi. Um, I'm trying to understand because you actually covered the entire spectrum of what can be done with robots in service sector. What is it that you are going to start with, and how much will it cost you to bring to market your first product? Actually, now, sir, um, we're already in. We're, we're already have one main client now for the um, restaurant industry we have Dunkin they, they and also we are and there how much what's the other question sir 
what uh, how long i mean what is, what is it doing so if you say you already have and what is it doing and uh, is it uh, more of a and another thing yeah uh another thing is um about what we're offering is we customize the robots um for the needs of the cost of the client for example for um the the duncan they ask us for um, automations in in their shop so we we address their needs and for example in hospitals if they want additional functions like automation we add that function too so we're not we just we although we we have a generic product for rent we can add extra um components that they will be needing for their special needs but for um it's either generic or customized or they can rent or purchase the whole thing those those are the offerings that we have sir okay thank you thank you sir aru ma'am dayan you have question uh, this looks like you need quite a lot of capital and um if win this will only be 500,000 pesos uh, yes ma'am where um, do you plan to get your counterpart funds to support you with your developing your market as of now ma'am um for example when we get an order we get a down payment and the down payment can help us start with the development of the order of the client so it's something like in construction you don't need so much money at the start but um you use the client's money to be able to build something from for them then after which we can get profit even at the very first order or for each order we get a profit and we get their deposit as our starting fund if you seem to have a clear idea of how to manage cash flow what would winning the the i the this 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 competition bring you what excuse me ma'am <laughs> what one more time you please you seem to have a clear idea of how to manage your cash flow but then yeah yeah what benefit would it have to you if you won this competition uh the one would be the mentoring another will be the connections and the exposure plus um if we could get a uh, more investors like fund help us fund um building more robotic systems for different kinds of industries like for the restaurant industry that would be a great help for us plus also we could with actually really want to provide um better salary or um packages for, or hire more employees because it, we actually need engineers and their expertise and as of now some were doing on um project based or uh, uh very good package for engineers but if we get um funding we could provide them and keep very good engineers to stay with us and be able to help develop the robotics industry of the Philippines because there are so many um talented engineers in the Philippines but the main problem actually is really the funding and developing their ideas thank you very much any other questions from the judges okay may uh Next, we will go to the next video. May we have the Thank video you. page? Thank you. May we have the video page of Team Erin? Erin. The biggest lesson we can take from our farmers is the value of hard work. But what if we can empower them to work not just harder, but also smarter? We are Team Erin, and we are reinventing farmers' hard work by innovating irrigation and nutrient management. Meet Mr. Bryce. He knows that proper irrigation and fertilizer application are critical for maximum crop yield with the best quality. Despite using fuel-fed water pumps to flood irrigate, he still needs to hire labor and work long hours at the farm. 
Meanwhile, water resources are scarce and fertilizer prices are skyrocketing. When the crops are suffering, our farmers are suffering. Our solution? Automated irrigation and nutrient management system where farmers can monitor real-time farm data, manage when and how much to irrigate and apply fertilizer, and automatically activate irrigation and fertilizer application. Arian is specifically designed to monitor farm status using comprehensive soil, weather, and water level sensors, analyze farm data to create soil amendment and fertilizer recommendations, and integrate fertilizers into the irrigation water. With Arian, our farmers can maximize the use of their time and energy, optimize the use of fertilizer and water resources, and improve overall crop health. Our farmers can interact with Arian system through its on-farm manual override switches, SMS capability for quick response, and offline web-based dashboard. Fertilizer application is inextricably linked with irrigation, yet our closest competitors are fragmented solutions like fuel and solar power water pumps and backpack battery sprayer. None of these eliminate the problem of laborious work and inefficient water and fertilizer use. Only Arian provides a centralized irrigation and fertilization solution with data-driven decision support and monitoring platform with self-diagnostic capability. Our business model has two phases. During the startup phase, our farmers can get an air system for an exclusive offer of 40,000 with free installation to their farms, two years after sales support and nutrient management training. They can also opt to avail our pay-as-you-grow model for flexible payment plan. On the next phase, we plan to expand our products and services and eventually transition to cloud-based air platform. Mr. Bryce, along with 400,000 other smallholder farmers in Cagayan Valley, still rely on traditional approach of rain-fed or flood irrigation and guesswork and fertilizer application. If we can get the 1% of the 400,000 small-scale farmers, it would be our first 4,000 customers. With a total seed fund of 280,000 pesos, we have successfully field-tested our first prototype. In fact, our farming community reported 45% less fertilizer application, 80% less water consumption, higher crop yields with higher quality produce, and no significant crop loss even during dry season. Since then, more local farmers and East-West Seed Company have reached out to us to learn about our technology. Right now, we are consulting with our partner TBI, Agritech Experts, and Soil Labs to develop our technology and marketing strategy. If awarded with the DICT Startup Grant Fund, we will dedicate this for product innovation, team building, IP and R&D, marketing and operational cost. Team Erin is composed of educators and engineers who all come from farming families. Our love for the farming community comes from the love of family. Through our automated irrigation and nutrient management system, we aspire to help our farmers improve their productivity and profitability without sacrificing sustainability. So, if you love... Thank you very much. Uh, I'd like to inform the judges that there are cases where in the videos of the, uh, the team were cut because they exceeded the limited um, allowed time for them. And I also apologize... Uh, to Sir James, uh, I did not see that you raised your hand. My apologies, sir. Okay, we will now proceed with the question and answer. Sir James? Hi. Uh, yeah, I'll kick it off. I have, um, I'm have. i curious about the cost of a uh, installation versus affordability. And the farmer to install and what is that in terms of their say their annual um, revenue or hello sir germs good uh, good afternoon i am first i'd like to introduce myself i am michael fragata i am the project leader so in terms of the cost of the system it would cost the farmers around forty thousand. that's around 25 to 30 percent profit margin right now they own uh, a smallholder farmer usually owns one fuel-powered system, at least here in our area, uh, fuel-powered pumping system and a uh, battery-powered uh, uh, sprayer. So that costs around 20000 So there's not much difference if we can compute that they would still would need to hire labor and then they would still um, have to... Uh, manage and monitor their farms so i we believe that the that the value of our product far exceeds the cost of the system so. 
and maintenance, can they do that themselves or in their community or do they need to pay someone to come in and maintain it? Ah, yes, sir. So right now, we, we are offering two months, uh, a two-year worth of service. But later on, we plan to expand our services like for preventative maintenance scheduled uh, quarterly where we can include that in our revenue stream, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Next question from Ma'am Dayan. Yeah, I just wanted to know what type of farms would benefit from this first? Um, who are, who's your first um, target market for the kind of farming farmers? Uh, thank you, Ma'am Dan, for that wonderful question. Actually, we are about to deploy one of our systems in a onion farm, which is a demonstration farm uh, funded by the Department of Agriculture in partnership with East West Seeds. So we are targeting uh, these high value crops farmers who are uh, who know that this is very very critical in terms of irrigation and um, applica uh, fertilizer application because right now there is lessening labor available labor in our area. Actually, in reality. Uh, most farmers here are willing to pay 1,000 pesos for labor just to irrigate their farms. The, and the labor uh, force is kind of uh, have, they're in the position to uh, uh, insist on that uh, price because they are, they are, there are very limited labor in our area. And I'd just like to include that during the implementation of our prototype, uh, most of our farmers here, our adopted community, got COVID. So that only emphasized how important the system is because our farmers were able to uh, initiate irrigation and fertilizer application despite not being able to go to their farms. That would be all. Thank you, Ms. Diane. Thank you. Thank you. And then we have a question from Sir Aru. Yeah, I'll uh, ask mainly, what is, is it, uh, are the farmers looking for the solution or, you know, you're creating a solution and that makes sense uh, to bring to them, but, you know, are they looking for this? Are they eagerly searching for a solution? Actually, the that's, uh, thank you, sir. So actually, I, I believe that we are in the best position to offer this technology because we live in, ag in an agricultural province. We come from farming families. That's why we can see that this is a huge problem for them. So the customer feedback is very quick and they are telling us that we are looking for a solar-powered water pump so they can still plant during uh, off-season. So when there is where there is more uh, higher prices of commodities, like they can be more productive when they have their own irrigation system. But what they don't realize, I, what they do realize that, but what we offer is that the automation itself that other companies can't offer. So our pro when our farmers saw this opportunity when we've conducted demos in our um, in our adopted community, many farmers were amazed and they are asking if they can just buy our system right then and there and avail this product, sir. Thank you very much. Although the time is up, we will still accommodate the question of Sir Abe and Sir Carlo. Sir Abe? All right. Um, is there anything proprietary with the system that you have right now? Uh, yes. So we plan to apply for IP for patenting so we can outsource our manufacturing of our circuit boards, sir. All right. Um, sir Carlo, your question. Hi. Yeah, I do have a question. I, I looked at your pitch deck and based on your team uh, composition, who is the CTO or who will be the one that would develop this? Because if you're asking for 
a grant. A lot of it will be coming from uh, your development of the app. So curious who would be doing it with the amount the fund will provide. Our CTO would be uh, Mr. Engineer Daniel Labadan, who is also here with me. Sir. So he is our head engineer. He's a computer engineer and led the programming of our system. Team Erin, we will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the video pitch of Team Omnichat. Hi, this is Ed and we are Omnichat. During this pandemic, if we want to avail most of the government services, we need to do it online. It's either through mobile apps, websites, Google Forms, emails, and other platforms. But these have brought quite challenges, especially to ordinary Filipinos. Using mobile apps is not that so easy. Further, using multiple websites is confusing since we have so many government agencies. And in worst cases, they are paying someone to do it for them, making it more expensive. Let us make it easier for ordinary Filipinos to have an access to online government services by providing single platform that is very common and easy to use. And based on the numbers, we know that Facebook would be the best platform. Introducing OmniChat. On our website, the government agency just need to select all the necessary information and requirements that they need from the user, after which a chatbot will be created and using FB Messenger, the applicant can submit information, documents, and requirements online, even in the absence of internet data subscription. This information will then be forwarded to the back-end system of concerned agencies and can be configured according to their needs. We have around 1,600 LGUs that has 42,000 barangay units and 1,600 government offices and attached agencies all over the country. Just imagine, online application for different types of permits and clearances, QR code, and even online payments all can be done through Omnichat. In fact, it is currently being used by PNP Region 2 on their e-servicio Lingkod Bayanihan program, which has more than 171,000 approved members. It is also being used in Oplan e-Visa where we have released 15,000 stickers at 50 pesos each and we are expecting around 400,000 stickers more. This product is free and we will generate our income on a per transaction basis or monthly maintenance fees. We are humbly asking for possible endorsement or collaboration with our government agencies and LGUs. If ever we will be funded, we will use it for marketing and hiring of additional manpower. Edison Simon worked for five years as IT head on BPR, an IT company based in Kawayan. Hans Magpantay and Lexter Ray Sabado were his most skilled and talented previous employees. I've worked for five years as unit head at FICO Bank and another five years as junior assistant manager at BDO. Thank you for listening. Thank you. Thank you, OmniChat. We will now open the five-minute question and answer. Judges? Yes. Ma'am Dayan? Hi, uh, this is great. Uh, the country really needs a lot of gov tech. Um, but what is your market like? Because you, you have LGUs, but you have the PNP, which maybe is a subset of the LGU. But what's, how big is the market? How big can it be? So your mic is mute. Oh. You're on mute. Yes, ma'am. Sorry. Um, yes, ma'am. As we have mentioned on our uh, pitch deck, so our market are the government agencies and its attached agencies. And based on our research, uh, we have around 1,600 government agencies and um, attached agencies. And for LGU, we have 1,600 LGUs and 42,000 uh, barangays. So that would be our uh, target and potential market for this particular product. 
Yeah, but uh, among those, uh, there's a certain uh, there's a factor of readiness, right? And the skill of the LGUs has have you factored that into your um, narrowing of the market? Yes, ma'am. Um, it's not particularly for the, for those LGUs that are um, offering those services online. Uh-huh. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Ma'am Bayan. Sir Abe, you have a question? Um, if I may ask, uh, what's your experience in uh, doing government deals? Um, no, sir. Uh, for, the, for dealing with a year of TV, of many visa, so we have presented with a uh, particular ordinance and several uh, LGUs in the region. So, so far, uh, we've been doing good with them. Uh, we, uh, we have never encountered the Except, of course, uh, during this pandemic, um, most of the um, sessions was rescued due to the availability of uh, counselors and sanguniang bayans. Alright, so my assumption is uh, these are under pilot, not yet under or haven't gone any government procurement yet. No, sir. Actually, we have included in our pitch deck that we have an existing traction, so the first one that we have dealt with was the uh, PNP, the whole PNP Region 2, wherein we have already uh, processed 171,000 application. And uh, another service of PNP, wherein we have all the deployed this uh, particular product, is the Oplan e-visa, wherein we have already released uh, 15,000 pieces of stickers, which we have charged around 50 pesos each. Um, if I may ask, uh, how much are the contract sizes for those projects? Yes, sir. Uh, for the uh, PNP link code by Nihan, so we do charge a monthly maintenance fee or subscription fee, which is around 25,000 pesos. But for the Oplan e-visa, uh, we use a revenue, uh, business revenue model wherein we are, charged, we are charging a per transaction basis. So it is, um, as mentioned, 50 pesos each for every approved and availed sticker whose application were being processed using our platform. All right, thank you. Thank you, thank you Sir Abe. Now we will proceed to Sir Aro. Yeah, I'm trying to understand uh, if you're targeting the LGUs, uh, there is a factor of integration with their core system with the front end chat bot, right? Yes, sir. Uh, how do you plan to achieve that? Because, you know, all the LGUs have different kinds of system. Most of them do not have any API and all kind of challenges. Yes, sir. Um, so for the LGUs who have a current API, so I have my whole uh, IT team who are expert on the integration. Actually, even for online payments, we have successfully made an integration. And for the LGUs, who does not have a, an API-ready system? So as we have mentioned on our pitch deck, we will be providing them a system that can be customized or configured in accordance to their needs. So this will be provided by our team as well. So to harmonize the system from chatbot to the uh, back-end system of particular LG, which we have did on PNP, by the way. Thank you. Additional questions from the judges? Okay. If there's none, thank you. Omnichat. We will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the video pitch of Team Jeepe. Uh, Eric Tan, founder and CEO of GPay. According to NAMA and GIZ Philippines, we have 250,000 jeepneys in the country, 55,000 within Metro Manila, and around 25,000 in Region 3. These numbers of iconic vehicles, its drivers, and commuters are facing challenges to cross over from the old Abot Abot to modern fare collection system brought by the Public Utility Vehicle Modernization Program and the current COVID-19 pandemic. Currently, jeepney drivers need to pivot their one hand skillfully to get the passenger's payment bare-handed while their other hand is on the steering wheel. 
the traditional system is inconvenient, risky, and COVID-prone for our drivers and commuters. Moreover, the modernization brings more expenses to operators due to the additional cost of equipment and monthly subscription by the third-party providers. Our team had a dialogue with several transport groups, drivers, and commuters in Region 3 about these fare collection dilemmas. According to them, they wanted their work collection platform to be cashless, cardless, simple, safe, and not expensive to set up. Only then, they will embrace the crossover from the traditional to modern payment system. After several months of requirement gathering, GPay heard them all via this gorgeous, modern, and sensible GPay mobile fare collection apps that you see right now. GPay business model is based on the service charge. We get 1% from commuters top up and drivers cash out. This will give us an estimated 750,000 peso daily revenue, 15 million peso monthly revenue from 25,000 jeepneys with average daily sales of 1,500. We are now strengthening our relationship to transport groups as our distribution channels by giving them profit sharing. Their drivers are covered by accident insurance. Their Suki commuters can avail free ride vouchers. Some competitors are Bipcard and SquidPay. Our management team is composed of entrepreneurs who own their respective businesses. GPA is also fortunate to have Mr. Wilson Chua as our startup advisor. GPA accomplishment status, we already raised 1 million peso from the pre-seed round and 1 million peso from the seed round. Now, we are 80% done with our MVP expected to roll out next year 2022. We acquired our SEC certificate, IPO trademarks, and pitchmark seal. Finally, GPay got the collaboration approval from LTFRB Region 3 to roll out an early adapter pace. God willing, if this will be done accordingly, wala nang abot-abot at gasto sa GPay! Para po! Thank you, GPay. We will now open the question and answer portion. Five minutes. Judges? I'm open top for the question and answer. Okay. Anyone from the judges? Thank you very much. Judge Day, uh, Ma'am Dayan? So, you got one million already and it got you this far to prototype. Um, how much money do you need for the next phase? Uh, and for the next year, po. Go ahead. To, to answer the question, for the next year, uh, cash flow, po, we need 14 million uh, to further develop our uh, product from MVP to MMM, MMP, minimum uh, viable product, minimum marketable product for the next year. And are your current uh, investors willing to go for another round or do you need to seek new investors? Actually, uh, right now, uh, we don't have really an investor that uh, we have in mind. Uh, we just stop our uh, immediate friends uh, for, for the funding that we got from now. That's why we're trying to seek uh, to another uh, angel investors or other government uh, agency that could help us to extend uh, the budget, the cash flow that we need for the next year. Any other question? Did I answer the question? Uh -huh. I'll pass it on to James. You might have more questions. Okay. Thank you. So James, go ahead. Yeah, I'll just go one brief one question wise. Um, can you tell me more about your competitors and, and why you'll beat them? Yeah, right now, uh, the primary uh, competitors uh, is Beepcard. Uh, Beepcard, as we all know, is um, uh, they're using the equipment, the reader, and the card to uh, do the transactions. So our pair collection system is not uh, card. It's not based on the card. We don't have any equipment. Uh, the equipment charge from the beef card is around 60,000 per equipment. And then they are uh, getting a, a monthly subscription fee from the operators. And GPay doesn't have all these costs. So the, the app is free, and we're just getting our uh, revenue from the 1% charge uh, for the drivers to cash out and for the commuter to top up on their uh, GPay wallet. How does the driver know the payment's been made? 
uh, there will be a notifications and uh, a process on the uh, driver app to uh, notify that there's a payment. And also if there's uh, someone who's going to do the para or stop, uh, there will be not notifications on the driver app. So will there be a picture of the face so he knows which of the 20 people hanging off the back have paid him? Or? Uh, we have we have the something like a uh, a QR code when the commuter sits on the particular uh, gypsy seat they were gonna scan the QR code and then they will get this information that this particular commuter sits on that particular seat so when they say para uh, by clicking on the ta on the app they will be notified and uh, the driver knows uh, where, where the passenger is located uh, we have some demo links if you want. Uh, I, I believe uh, we submitted uh, the the Excel sheet. Uh, you, you can uh, probably uh, you know experience that on our prototype. I hope I answered the question. Thank you, Sir James. Now we will proceed to Sir Aru. Sir, I'm trying to understand what's going to happen if I'm the commuter and I don't have the app or I don't have a phone. If you don't have the smartphone as a commuter, uh, you will go back to the uh, traditional way of paying the, the jeepney, sir. Okay, and uh, why would the commuter want to use it compared to just giving cash, which is easier? Uh, because uh, our, our uh, new normal right now, uh, uh, IATF is encouraging the new normal, which is uh, contactless you know, payment. Because if we're gonna do the traditional, you know, the driver will kind of touch the pair and the coins, and, and that's not the new normal uh, 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 efficient way of doing it. And typically, the the drivers and the operators are have memorandums from LTFRB to adapt uh, to have all the jeepneys to have a fare collection system, a GPS system. And uh, it's, a, it's a catalyst from the government. So it, the, go, the government is encouraging it. So that's the reason why we, we have to follow. Thank you, Sir Arup. Now we will have a question from Sir Abe. Sir Abe, your question. All right. Um, how, far, how far along are we with the uh, uh, collaboration with um, LTFRB? Or are there any other discussions with private transport groups? Yeah, uh, we already secured a collaboration agreement with Region 3, sir. Uh, Region 3 has uh, 25,000 uh, drivers and vehicles as they uh, uh, exposed to us. And uh, we had around 10 transport group right now or cooperatives that are uh, about to sign a MOA with them that they were going to participate on the early adopters program. So how many are installed? Uh, right now, we don't have any uh, installation right now or downloading going on. It will happen on next year, sir, per January 2022. Uh, right now, we're just uh, solidifying all the relationship through MOA and agreements uh, before we uh, are going to do the downloads or actual use of the applications. Okay. So around when are we expecting actual use of the applications then? Uh, around January, sir, January uh, 2022, next year, Pop. It will be right. available on uh, Play Store. All right. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Any additional? Uh, ah, Mom says you have a question. Go ahead. Uh, can I just get the ballpark of how many people in your team are working on this full time? Uh, it's around eight people, Mom. Uh, two two back end developers, uh, three Android developers, uh, uh, two full stack developers. Uh, me also as a project manager and Chris is here is a scrum master uh, and uh, Anderson Tan is here also as our Android developer okay okay thank, thank you. you very much thank hello everyone meet Tane Flora farming for almost 20 years each start of farming season, she'll borrow money to buy her farming needs. And along her journey, 
Since she is not yet harvesting, she'll borrow again to support her family's needs. This borrowed money entails huge interest. Loan after loan from a 60,000 profit from the harvest, she'll just take home at around 2,000 pesos. This is not just Nanay Flora's journey. 3.7 million more are stuck in this cycle. Hi, my name is Lester, a registered farmer, CEO, and co-founder of Farmbox. Farmbox has the mission to uplift the lives of our local farmers by helping them have access to quality farming essentials and different agricultural solutions, eliminating loans after loans, which drag their family or farmers to the poverty line. Through our sponsors, they purchase the all-in box, which contains all the farmers' needs to change their lives, from farming essentials, trainings, handbooks, tools, and even a customer for the produce. Once you have a box already, there will be a net profit sharing at the end of each farming cycle, and we have these other streams of income to continue our support for our partner farmers. We want to tap the likes of Paolo to sponsor the boxes, the millennials who takes part of the 27.6% of the Philippine workforce and has a stable income, wants to grow this money passively, and wants to create an impact to the community. These are the stages from handing out the boxes, helping our farmers grow, market the produce, and share the profit to our partners. We have three communities already in Batangas and still want to tap uh, communities in Southern Luzon and later on around the Philippines. As of today, we have a revenue of 1.4 million and we are looking to grow at 8 million in 2023. For us to keep track of, of our success, and the impact we are creating, we are assessing the agricultural productivity, the selling price of the produce, and having partners because keeping this high will improve our profits. Among our competitors, our advantage is that we are eliminating all possible loan interests in the entire farmer's journey, improve the profits of our farmers through farming with sure demand. To further grow the farm box and our partners, we need an investment to strengthen our market base machineries and equipment, new technologies on farming activities, and platform improvement. And here's the team behind Farmbox with expertise to drive the growth of the company. Just like Nanay Flora, there are more that needs our help. We want to rewrite their stories. The next farming season will be a new day for hope and success. Let's be part of that story. So judges, let's help our local farmers one box at a time. Thank you. Thank you, Farm Bax. We will now open the five-minute question. Sir Abe, you have... Huh? Oh, sorry, that was for the previous one. Ah, okay. What about mom, uh, mom, they, uh, mom says you have a question? Um, yeah. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, ma'am. I'm not sure I understand. Hello, can you hear me? Yes, yes. Yes, ma'am. I just wanted to, because I was checking, so just clarify that for me. So the, okay, secure box payment, please log in. Okay. Can you walk me through the, 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 the customer journey for this? Okay, for the customer journey, so our part, our, our, our sponsors will just purchase a box on our e-commerce platform. And once we have purchased the box, we will be confirming it and assigning a farmer. Uh, for that box. So once they have uh, once they have paid the boxes, we will be assigning it to a farmer. Then uh, we will be informing them where is the box will be for, uh, will be placed and also who is the farmer and the look and uh, what crops or what uh, produce that will be uh, the, on that uh, on that box. And uh, our we will be updating once in a while our customers. And after a farming cycle, they will just have to receive a notification from us that their payout is already is ready, and they will be uh, they can withdraw their uh, the cost of box plus the net profit share from the harvest. Have you, have you time to turn around time for all of this? It seems like a long a long a long value chain for you to deliver. Your um, I, uh, this uh, that's one that's the problem that we are eliminating. We don't uh, give the uh, loans even on the journey of the farmers from uh, after uh, having the capital, uh, uh, carrying it, we provide allowances. And also, we uh, we help them on trainings and skills development. 
as as a matter of fact, we have all, uh, we have now a program, an acceleration program for our farmers that within two years they will be graduating to farm box. They will not be uh, they will be self sustained farmers. Uh, we will be helping them uh, build their own business through the program. Uh, as uh, as a matter of fact, we also have a farmer already that is in the program. We are helping he, uh, her to have his own uh, her own uh, pig uh, breeding business wherein she will be the one to uh, to supply farm box the piglets that will be given also to the farmers. So it's an end-to-end skill uh, uh, evolving of our farmers to be self-sustained, productive, and empowered farmers. Okay, thank you. Ma'am Diane, to be followed by Sir Kylo. Yeah, I uh, congratulate the team because uh, this is something that I... Is like the future of farming, and um, it's quite successful in many parts of the U.S. It's community-supported agriculture. And um, I wanted to know if you are going to invest in building the tech yourselves, or are you going to try to find an off-the-shelf solution that you can buy? I don't think it exists in the Philippines yet, but uh, might have to buy it off um, some some existing tech already in, in other geographies? Uh, 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 if I understand correctly, the question is that we have a platform wherein our, for, uh, our sponsors can have the boxes and we also have a CRM for our farmers. Uh, we have installed internet on the hotspots of, uh, of, of our communities, Care of Globe. Uh, and uh, another thing is that we really want to elevate farming and the farmers here in our country that's why we uh, uh, as uh, we we want them to evolve uh, from what they are doing today uh, so that means you you've built the platform already yes we have built the platform already and we are still improving it so that we can have a date also a more data driven uh, solutions for our par- partner farmers like uh, uh, entering the data for the chicks development for the chicken uh, feeding for the, uh, the pig so that they will know really uh, the ins and out of the activities of farming okay. Who, who's your competition for this locally currently uh, we have uh, Crapital however Crapital became a lending business for the farmers they are uh, lending this uh, lending our farmers with a minimal interest rate, but what we want on Farmbox is that uh, we want them really to not just get money and uh, eliminate first the loans and not just get money, but uh, elevate them, empower them to be uh, successful farmers and we will not be uh, needing Farmbox moving forward, I hope, and we, w- we will be going to the next farmers that needs our help. Thank you, Sir Carlo. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation. Uh, I, I have a question on the partnerships on your pitch deck. Uh, can you run us through how, why JV Shawarma or the Shawarma Shack actually see you guys as a long-term partner? Yes. For, uh, like, uh, for, uh, what we are doing with our farmers is that we are also partnering with different uh, businesses and enterprises for them to deliver the produce of the farmer. So we're cutting the multiple middlemen along the chains, which will which uh, improves the profit also of our custom uh, of our farmers. Uh, this like shawarma shop and uh, Sha- uh, and JB Shawarma. Uh, 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 we ensure them to give the farm fresh produce from our farmers. And like uh, f- like what we are doing is connecting our farmers to the end users of uh, of the of the produce, which is uh, which orders bulk, so this this one uh, it 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 improves the profit of our farmers by around eighty to one hundred twenty percent because we've cut already the middleman. Okay, so thank you very much, Farmbacks. Let's proceed to the next finalist. May we have the big two pH of Uproot Urban Farms. Eatings and Robbie's from Amplit and we grow fresh food closer to home. Majority of the food in Metro Manila is sourced over 300 kilometers away, which results in the high prices and, 
poor quality of vegetables. And because of our complicated food supply chain, billions of pesos of agri products are lost each year, equivalent to more than 2,000 tons of fresh food being thrown out every day, which could have fed thousands of Filipinos during the pandemic. In fact, hunger rates reached record numbers as more than 15 million Filipinos went hungry and six in every 10 households said they were food insecure. And with climate change, each year we face stronger typhoons and longer droughts, affecting both price and supply availability. In terms of market sales, over 1 million metric tons of vegetables are delivered to Metro Manila annually, worth over $240 million. This is still small compared to the billion-dollar vegetable industry of our ASEAN neighbors. In fact, the country still imports more than $3 million worth of vegetables each year because local production is simply not enough to meet the demand. The challenge now is how to ensure the continued supply of food because while supply is available, there is a problem of inconsistency. And a food will address that with this value proposition. By bringing the farm direct to cities, where shorter distance means better quality produce. Our indoor farm grows food all year round near the point of consumption. It removes the need to transport vegetables from far distances, reducing food wastage. It takes 30 square meters of space, but the production capacity is equivalent to more than 2,000 square meters of farmland, eliminating the need for big plots of land to grow food. But more importantly, we grow fresh food that is sustainable and better for you and the environment. In terms of our traction, our urban farms have provided 100% increase in revenue for our community growers. We have zero post-harvest loss as we only harvest on demand and deliver within a few kilometers away. We have grown over 7,000 kilos of high-value crops on a regular basis, amounting to over $84,000 in total or this. This is the team behind a group that is trying to change the status quo of how we grow and eat our food. We have over 30 years of combined experience in management, operations, and food production. We don't just grow food in the fruit, we also cultivate eggs, which is why part of our proposal is the expansion of our shipping container farms located in cities across Metro Manila. It will help lessen food wastage and generate over 6 million in annual revenues for our community. But more importantly, generate over 70 tons of our food on a regular basis to address the food shortage supply here in Metro Manila because fresh and safe food nourishes not just our health but the entire country as well. We are a fruit and we believe that no Filipino should be hungry. Thank you very much. Thank you, Aproot Urban Farms. Now the question and answer portion is open. Five minutes, judges. Sir Abe, you have a question. Um, so Robby, the eighty-four thousand dollars worth of uh crops, um, is this annual or uh since Aprut was founded? Oh, yeah, uh, it, it, it's you know uh since we were founded, uh well we but we started our vegetable um distribution back in twenty nineteen only. All right, so at least for twenty twenty one, at what GMV are we looking at? Sorry, sir. Can you repeat the question? Um, how much? Maybe, maybe how much crops were you able to sell for this year? Oh, um, uh, well, right now it's around, you know, uh, close to twenty thousand dollars, close to a million. Since twenty twenty one, our 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 our, our uh, I would say our biggest uh, bulk of our sales came last year. During the pandemic, uh, during the heightened lockdowns. So, if I understand correctly, uh, 2021 did not perform as good as 2020. Well, uh, no. Uh, in terms of uh, actually, our, our problem right now is the uh, the supply. Um, th there's a demand. It's just that we, um, our, our current production is not at par with the demand. So we're we're actually missing on on a lot of you know. So, what current uh, concerns or maybe operational restrictions are you experiencing right now? Uh, right now would be our 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 production side. So it's not it's not, it's it actually uh, lacks the uh, no. um, So we're we're actually um, we're we're supposed to expand to more uh, 
community farms. But then, uh, due to the lockdowns, we were um, the, the the plants were pushed through. I um, mean, uh, stopped. So uh, we're we're although we're we're pushing through uh, right now, and then we're we're thinking at uh, by by th- second quarter next year, we're able to you know put up or we're a- able to sustain the the current demands that you know, that our, our our customers needs. All right. Thank you. Thank you. A question from Sir Arup. Uh, yeah, I'm just trying to understand uh, because you started with the premise that your startup is going to help um, farmers who are throwing away food, um, etc. But then uh, your solution ended up by saying you're going to bring the farm into the city. So how is that problem and that solution connected? Right. Uh, okay, sir. Uh, so right now, uh, because of our uh, very complicated food supply chain, uh, the vegetables that we normally uh, get to eat <clears throat> goes through eight to ten different layers before it, it's served to us. So from a farmer to a harvester, middleman to the biajeros, tenderos to the palenques, and so on and so forth. And <clears throat> all of these added layers results to almost 50% of vegetables lost to, due to poor handling because we... We don't really have uh, enough cold chain facilities uh, to help re- reduce a uh, post harvest loss. So, so maybe, uh, maybe uh, what you're seeing is uh, your solution. What you're solving is a fresh vegetable. So you're providing a fresher vegetable, higher quality vegetable, perhaps. That's what you're providing rather than solving the uh, provincial farmers' problem. Correct? Oh uh, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Okay, and uh, okay, so. Now, going back to that, uh, how about the cost side of things? Um, if you are going to farm it in the city, um, how does it compare to the cost of farming it in the province? And especially if we have so many farmers. So, um, just to give you a, a comparison, sir, our, our, our national average or for production for lettuce is at around 7.7 tons per hectare um, with <clears throat> with our system um, we're able to grow uh, uh, three tons uh, using just 30 square meters of uh, space it, it's more productive it's a uh, uh, higher productivity yes sir yes sir but we're, we're, we're also dealing with the high uh, perishable crops not not the regular uh, by Kubo uh, vegetables that are uh, the traditional farms uh, used to grow. Okay, understood. Thank you, Sir Aru. I'd just like to ask if we still have additional questions from the judges. None? Okay. Thank you, Urban. Uh, so we will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the video pitch of Tim Boatman?
Thank you very much, Tim Thank Holtman. you very much. We will now open the five-minute Q&A from the judges. Judges? Judges? That is going to start. Uh, I'll start. Um, Go ahead, so, sir. Michael, Michael, can you tell us more about the insurance, um, how that works? Have you actually got a cover note or anything in place? Is it affordable? Uh, yes, we're looking for a micro insurance available for 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 boat owners because uh, there's currently a rule here in the Philippines that all passengers must have insurance. But the thing is, it it's, it does not include the small uh, boats. So we're looking for micro insurance that can uh, give us or that can partner with us. For now, what we have is or what we're looking is the one that Grab is using. Uh, there's an insurance that Grab is uh, the name of the company, or there's a company that Grab uses, and then check the price. It's around uh, 500 pesos. But we're looking for a micro insurance that can only provide travel insurance for that particular day or particular uh, days of the travel. If it's a uh, if it's a round trip, then uh, that's what we're going to offer uh, to the passengers and to the boat owners or the drivers. Okay. Is that 500 per boat per day or what's that basis? It's uh, per year. Per year, okay. Yes. But we're looking for something that's, that they can offer for uh, for that particular day only. Because uh, what, I, what I do know is there's a lot of insurance there that offers that particular uh, option that you can get an insurance for this day, for this day only. All right, thank you. Okay, thank you. Other judges, you have questions? Judge Abe, you have questions, boss, or Abe? Yeah, um, so if, if I understand correctly, this works with or the, the target drivers that you have are the smaller boats, not the ships. Um, the boatman application has four stages. It will start with the the fisher folks because that's why they 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 media came to life because I noticed that I want I want to go to the next island. The thing is, there's no platform for me to or there's there's no driver that can or boat that can bring me to that island. So what I did is I asked the fisher folks nearby, "Can I rent your boat?" And well, guess what? They were happy. Because it's an additional income to them. So that's why the idea came to, what if I can create a platform for these fisher folks, right? So they can just log in or sign up. And then I can, I can ask or they can offer me a fee. Or what I'm going to do is we're going to ask the fisher folks to set up the fee first initially. Because uh, we, don't, we don't know the, the charges or petroleum products on every island it's different so yeah, maybe if i may at least move on to the next uh after that um, i think uh, the uh question which i wanted to ask because the assumption at least with um car or at least land transportation is the idle time of these uh, vehicles would you have an idea if uh these boats have a lot of un idle time or are the personnel assigned to these vehicles unproductive during those times if ever how long there will be two options for the Boatman app. There will be on-demand and scheduled trip. So if it's on-demand, that's, that, that's, uh, we're, we're going to set a time for 30 minutes or, or six hours. Then scheduled trip will be just scheduled for another day, for a, for a calendar day. So the, it's, it's, not somewhat, it's somewhat similar to Grab or Uber, but the thing is, you will, it will not be calculated for, for kilometer or for for nuts or, or because what we're going to do is we're going to ask the user to set up the pickup point and the drop off point on the island. And then the driver themselves, they're already set the fare for it. We cannot set the fare initially because we don't know the, the oil pet or the petroleum products cost in that area or in that island. So we're going to let the drivers first set it. And then once everything is configured, you're going to find a way to uh, compute the efficiency of machines of those or those uh, motors per per boat. 
All right. Thank you. Thank you. Last question from Mom says. Hi. I uh, just very quickly. Do you guys have a data on how many people the the, the the market for this? I mean, I would assume it's a pretty spread out number, right? Do you have data for that? There's no there's no data for it because this will be the first of its kind in the Philippines. Actually, I mean, it's the first of its is the first of its kind in the south in Southeast Asia. Yes, go ahead, Nan. Okay, but I mean, because you were riding on tourism, right? So, aren't there any tourism numbers about how many? Yes. Uh, according to the Department of Tourism, there is around four. It's our surround of four billion or eight billion tourism next year. Once the pandemic is is lifted or there's the COVID restrictions are lifted, there will be around eight million or eight billion travels. That's according to uh, Department of Tourism, and mm -hmm. local local travels is around eight 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 billion, and then foreign travels foreigners will be around five billion. Um, okay, but that that that. I assume that's segmented also, right? With hotels, etc. And, you know, the whole chasm. But, okay, never mind. So, in their presentation, I, I, I can't open your... So, I can't... But you had mentioned that... So, the 100... So, you used the 100 peso, the bar breakdown, 80 pesos, and then 20. Yung 80... And then it said 80 for the drivers and then 20 for the boatman. What's the difference? Can you educate me? What's the difference between the drivers and the boatman? Uh, the boatman is the app. The drivers will be the boat owners or, or the boat captains. So, the, so okay, so the, the people who, ah, okay. Ah, okay. Okay, okay, never mind. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, I apologize to Ma'am Diane. We ran out of time for your question, Po. Thank you very much, boatman. We will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the video pitch of Naked Hub or Naked Hub. Naked Hub. Great day! We are honored to share with you the innovation that works in our school and community and will definitely work for you. Our school is situated in the coastal barangay of Pilibaka kay Albay. It is normal for the islanders to experience difficulties in their travel at sea due to the knee deep mud and mountainous terrain and very poor mobile reception. The situation is worsened by the COVID-19 pandemic where movement is restricted and education is affected, similar to what other schools are currently experiencing. Our innovation brings the future much closer to the remote communities of Bakakai and soon the whole province of Albay. We are very responsive to the special needs of the public and private schools from the mainland and island barangays with or even without the pandemic. Presenting to you the newly introduced the internet hub or simply the Nikit Hub. It is a wireless internet network used for downloading and uploading of learning resources and for other vital functions without requiring the user any internet nodes. Through the access points, downloading of learning resources and uploading of outputs can be done anytime and anywhere in the barangays where the students reside. Teachers and residents of the communities can interact even when the internet is down. Thus, learning and normal life continue while keeping everyone safe from COVID-19 and other natural hazards like the typhoon and the flash floods. Naked Hub is unique and efficient. We are using the existing ICT facilities of DepEd, open source applications, equipment, and network devices that are affordable yet effective. We also have cell phone applications for the easy access of the users. In just a touch of a finger, they are already connected while parents can communicate without internet and perform important functions to its endless capability. But wait, there's more. We are offering Nikita installation services for short or long-range base stations and also remote stations package that is user-friendly and at a very affordable price. Our grade 10 to 12 students are already enjoying the benefits of the innovation. To level up and expand, we are consulting officials in our local government unit, initially trained 20 teachers, and scheduled to train ICT coordinators of Devil Bar. We also ensure partnership with the community we are serving who can use our offline services anytime. After the establishment of partnership, we project to gain net income of 64% for short-range remote station, 52% for long-range remote station, 
48% for short-range remote station and 42% for long-range remote stations and should increase within 5 years. The grant shall be used to ramp up research and development to improve the services that the Nikit Hub can provide. We have the best team for the project. Trust us as we bring the future much closer to the communities we serve. Thank you and a pleasant day once again. Thank you very much, Nick. 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 Thank you very much. We will now open for the five minute question. Judges or our. Uh, I'm trying to understand uh, if my understanding was correct from the presentation. So you are you're installing something like an intranet um, uh, it's, that has some contents also bundled uh, to benefit the school related needs, correct? Yes, sir. That's it. An offline, offline wireless intranet, uh, which will be uh, deployed so in basically. So it's like a wide area. Yeah, uh, but, but, kind of a thing uh, without internet. Yeah, but that, that that's it, sir. Okay, and then who's paying those? You mentioned 31, 37, etc. LGUs. Uh, at this moment, the we have uh, sponsors here at the school for our testing testing phase of this project who uh, given us given us this budget in order for us to uh, implement this in our school. That's why we're planning it. To, to, be, to have it uh, in all the province of Albay and, of course, to other schools also in the Philippines. So you are going to install the entire network across the island and maintain no, it? Uh, no, sir. Just actually, uh, facilities will be installed per school. This will be installed uh, per school, but uh, in every school. We, have, we will be installing... Uh, an internet facility for every school. Uh, it will be like that. In not internet, but this one, right? Which is basically uh, a local um, internet network, sir, in the school. We still and be, then how will one school connect with other? Uh, uh, we can use the remote remote station facility, which will be placed in far barangays of the school where it is serving the students. It will be like that. Okay, and, and who will maintain those when there is a storm, things falls down, breaks down, etc.? We have, we have already other city coordinators of the schools. We are training it right now. We're training them. So for them to maintain, and we will be providing also uh, technical support for them to maintain the facility. So around the school, the students of the school can take benefit of it. That's the idea, right? And what's yes, the sir. range yes, from the school uh, uh, that kids can access? Uh, if that is a base station, which actually inside in the school, uh, uh, the with the strength with the range of the access points, they have pretty range of uh, five to twenty meters, thirty meters. So they will no longer get inside the campus. They can just. Uh, uh, get into the range of the access point and they can already download the, the learning materials of, the, of their subjects. Uh, that's like that. But, and for, for far barangays, we will be installing remote stations so that if the distance is really very far from the school, we have one kilometer or two kilometer distance, we will be installing the remote station for that particular barangay, in barangay halls or in church in the barangay. Thank you, sir. Uh, additional questions from the other judges? None so far? Okay. Um, we thank you, madam. Now, thank you very much. Thank you. We will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the video pitch of team views panay 360.ph.
Hi, good afternoon. This is Vida Aurora C, Head of Business Development of Views Technology Solutions, Inc., bringing you Panay360.ph, your 360i in Panay. Before pandemic, Iloilo has already shown an impressive increase in the number of registered business establishments as well as available properties. The city has also been a consistent player in the top condo market emerging cities. These numbers would already be enough to highlight the overall investment potential, not only of Iloilo, but also of the entire Panay Island. However, we have also noted these gaps and untapped or unmaximized opportunities in terms of the promotion of the investment potential of the Western Visayas region. We have here the infrastructure, the skills, the creativity. So how else do we bring that supply closer to the bigger market? These insights led us to Panay360.ph, a search engine optimized website showcasing 360 degree virtual tours. It will feature a wide range of residential and commercial properties, accommodation establishments, tourism landmarks, retail stores, and virtual trade fairs. It will be an engaging go-to guide for anyone who wants to buy, rent, or stay, eat, explore, and learn, or shop and source from Western Visayas. In a macro perspective, we position Panay360.ph to be an investment promotion platform for Panay, helping local economy bounce back. This is also a complement to the growing focus and encouragement for investments in key cities outside Metro Manila. With Panay360.ph, we hope to give an extra marketing hand to our property owners and their sales and marketing agents, the business owners and their trade fair organizers. For our customers, their desired ROI for an investment platform is higher conversion rate. So with Panay360.ph, we aim to achieve that through search engine optimization, e-commerce capability, and analytics monitoring. Our platform's revenues would be coming from our standard listing fees, hosting of trade fairs, additional site features, and premium user subscriptions. Currently, we are in the prototype testing phase and we are set for beta launch by December of this year. We are also targeting to be all over Panay by the end of next year, expanding one province per quarter. We will also be launch launching two offshoot products by next year. And once we have kicked off in two to three areas in Panay, we will then start laying the groundwork for outside Panay expansion. Without targeted growth in mind, we project that majority of our funds will have to go to the purchase of additional equipment and the upgrading of our tech infra to enable us to scale up and expand while supporting the projected growth of our platform. So with that, we invite you to join us in bringing more people inside the scene of what Panay has to offer. Once again, this is Views Technology Solutions, Inc., bringing you Panay360.ph, your 360i in Panay. Madamo, git ka salamat. Thank you very much, Panay360.ph. Now we will now open. Yes. Judges. Ma'am Dayan? Yeah. Um, what's the problem again? <laughs> Sorry. I didn't quite appreciate the problem. Um, we actually want to provide an immersive and engaging material for our property owners and business owners to showcase their properties and businesses to a bigger market or to the larger market. Oh, do the property owners so your your customers are your property owners, right? Yes. Paul. And is that did you do customer discovery interviews that led you to this problem? Um yes, Paul. We were able to talk with a few um property owners here in Iloilo and um it was also through the, these interviews that we were able to come up with Panay360.ph. So they were, because um, during the pandemic, we had a lot of um, 
we had a lot of vacant spaces in our commercial spaces here in Iloilo. There were a lot of, um, there was a construction boom in Iloilo before the pandemic, but then pandemic came and um, rentals and leases um, really dropped low. But at the same time, there were a lot of seekers actually in Manila. So we saw that the problem is really to bring or to connect our property owners here in Iloilo to the seekers in Metro Manila or even outside Metro Manila. Oh, I see. Okay. But like how few, how many? I guess it, it looks like a, a short lifetime for this this product, I'm, I'm presuming. Um, is it after the pandemic, then there will be lots of matching that has, that has to be done? Um, how, how long do you see this problem to exist? Um, we still see for the sol- uh, the platform to be a solution even after the pandemic because um, even if travel restrictions will already be lifted and we can already travel freely and more frequently, um, we still see that um, especially for business owners who want to expand and look for a commercial space here in Iloilo, they would still want to you know, make their search or make their canvassing um, more efficient, save on time. So we want to provide this or we want our 360 virtual tours to be um, a better or more effective material to showcase a property for them so that they um, they can already shortlist their choices even before they physically visit, they physically visit the site. Okay, thank you, Ma'am Dayan. Sir James? Thank you. Um, I'll be quick. Um, are you a, you're a property agent now, a property manager? Um, no, Paul. Um, uh, we're, we're not in the property business, but um, it, it came across or it came about during discussions with a lot of friends who are property owners. Um, my husband is an architect who is a consultant for a commercial space and um, it was built before the pandemic, but then um, it was supposed to be launched during the pandemic. But um, until now, there's only, I think, three are um, 20% occupancy. And there are a lot of those um, similar commercial spaces in Iloilo that are in need for better marketing materials to promote their spaces. Yes. Um, and do you see this as a business or a, a scalable startup? And they're both um, businesses, but if you get my question. Um, yes, Paul. We are actually not just looking at, um, although we're starting with 360 virtual tours of um, properties or real estate, whether commercial or residential, but we're also looking at expanding to include um, um, hotels, uh, even event spaces for um, as soon as we start revitalizing the mice industry. And then... Um, we also are, we are also looking at um, our offshoot products, which are um, Panay 360 for schools, which will create um, 360 virtual tours of museums and art galleries for our students. And then um, we we uh, we see a lot of potential platforms that can actually be created from 360 material 360 virtual tours. So. We are looking at launching offshoot products from the same materials, but for a different industry or for a different um, customer segment. All right, we're out of time, so I'll leave it there. Thanks. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, 360.ph. Thank you, Paul. Thank you very much. The first part of the final pitching is done. So how was it, everyone? So some may have placed their bets on a certain finalist who impressed them, but wait, we will still have the second part of the pitching later. Before we continue, we'll introduce our global class keynote speaker this afternoon. He is a corporate leader, entrepreneur, speaker, and author. He's also one of the youngest members of the professional faculty at ICS Berkeley's Haas School of Business and has built many successful ventures. 
Let us have Mr. Aaron McDaniel, the co-founder and head of entrepreneurship of 10 Times Innovation Lab for his keynote message. the world and I wanted to share with you a few insights to be able to help you think about that journey. Uh, next slide. So uh, in starting to share with this, I'm going to use an example, an American company, pretty well known called Walmart, uh, who um, decided a, a few years ago to launch in Germany. And, uh, and they basically said, we have this great model that we used in the US, we're going to take that Walmart way, that American way, and we're going to implement it in Germany. And uh, they thought that, you know, they had the, the resources and uh, the best value proposition in order to do that. But in reality, they ended up failing miserably. And in the process, spent uh, over a billion dollars in, uh, in acquiring companies to then implement their model and failing. And part of the reason is because the German market is just different. Like, any other global market across the world. Uh, they had had this value proposition in the US of low prices. Well, it ended up in Germany that the prices that customers were able to get were even lower. Uh, when it came to products in, in America, a lot of um, meats are prepackaged. Well, in Germany, they like to actually visit a butcher and be able to see the meat being cut. And then finally, one of the big hallmarks of Walmart as a company in the US are friendly staff. Uh, the cashiers are very friendly. And at the front of these big stores, there's a greeter who makes an effort to welcome people in. And while that's great in the U.S., it actually freaked the Germans out. It was very much weird for their culture. And so ultimately, uh, they failed. Next slide. So uh, when you're thinking uh, at that stage, you reach in your company uh, to, to look at other markets, don't be Walmart. <laughs> uh, next slide. So... Uh, so part of the reason that I'm here is, is my, my co-author and co-founder of 10X Innovation Lab, Klaus Vihe, uh, and I basically realized during the pandemic that there was no book on effective international business expansion. You have books like Good to Great that are for large corporations, Zero to One for uh, entrepreneurs who are just starting a business, The Lean Startup for companies who are looking to find product market fit, um, but there was nothing about international business. And so that set Klaus and I off on this, this interesting journey over the last year, next slide, where we ended up, um, you know, at first Klaus was like, let's, let's talk to 30 business executives who focused on international and we'll see if there's an opportunity there. And I think I was a little pessimistic at the time. I said, I don't think 30 people would be willing to talk to us. Maybe 10 would or something. Well, anyway, fast forward this year, we spoke to over 250 executives from 50 different countries uh, leading a wide variety of companies from the former head of international at Apple, who managed a hundred billion dollar profit and loss statement, all the way to one of the launchers in Uber, who was the first person on the ground who launched five or six markets for the company, uh, as well as companies from many different countries, from one of the co-founders of, of Rakuten in Japan, senior executive of Line, uh, senior executive of Canva, and many other companies here that you'll see and more. And, and uh, next slide. Ultimately, what we found is that everybody was reinventing the wheel. They would all go in and figure out how to expand internationally, make a lot of mistakes, spend a lot of money, waste a lot of time. And I think it really came into perspective for us when we spoke to some individuals who had previously, before going into executive operational roles, had worked at McKinsey and Boston Consulting Group and Bain. And they told us we didn't have any frameworks from working at one of the top consulting firms in the world to know what to do. And so that's why we have decided to basically build this, uh, this book and the content around it and help companies who are looking at expanding internationally. And uh, next slide. 
And, and so the, the best way to really explain what we're doing is what Eric Ries, the author of The Lean Startup did. So he didn't invent the agile methodology. It was happening in a lot of different places. He had a company that used it. But he was the first to really come together and create a common vocabulary and set of frameworks and socialize it very well. And, and that's why it's really spread all over the world. And now it's not just used by startups, but governments and large organizations, large, large corporations as well. Next slide. Um, and, and part of the reason why this is particularly important now is because we believe that the pandemic represents a shift in business. So just like the dot-com boom, companies born before versus after think, act, operate differently. And those that took advantage of the power of the internet uh, basically were the ones that won the day. They disrupted a lot of markets and had been very successful. Um, we believe that the, the analogy for, for the pandemic is those that understand virtual and distributed work um, and, and ultimately take advantage of that. And those that understand that the different economies across the world are not just sources of less expensive labor, but are actual developed economies where there are customers. Um, those are the companies that are going to be successful. Next slide. And so what we did was we created what we call the global class mindset. And in the process of creating this mindset, we also developed um, uh, more details on what these companies do, who they're made up of in terms of people, and then ultimately how they go about expanding to, uh, to new markets um, and, and, and a number of frameworks in order to support that. And so just to give a little insight on this global class mindset, uh, we've heard from time to time this notion of companies being born global. And we don't really think that's an accurate depiction for how it works. You, you need to find validation and scale for your business in one market, um, because otherwise it would just be too difficult to attempt to do it too many times at once. But global class companies think global day one, meaning they build their product, they build their team, they build their company culture, they build their processes in a way that can be localized for different markets or have a certain universality to them. And then because of the pandemic, there's a different view that global class companies have on talent. So in the past, it was a very centralized or at the very least clustered uh, strategy. So, um, you know, companies would hire employees at a headquarters or if they were hiring in another market, it was very clustered together. Like, let's say we need cybersecurity expertise. Well, we're going to go hire 30 people in Israel because there's a lot of expertise for that there. Um, but global class companies realize that talent is everywhere. Even individual employees can be hired in, in, in a country and, and ultimately global class companies use them to understand and gain access and entry to those countries. There's also, because of this shift, an opportunity for headquarters to play a different role. Traditionally, this legacy mindset was the headquarters was command and control, pushing down what needed to happen to local markets. But as the notion of what headquarters is, is changing, you know, Previously, it used to be all the leadership in a company in one building or one corporate campus and, and or, you know, even one set of offices next to each other. Now, people are being spread all over the world. And so there's an opportunity for headquarters to be more of an enabler and supporter. And also, it's given way to uh, not the company way, like with Walmart, but the local way, um, which is uh, what global class companies do. Next slide. So uh, what do these companies do? They localize. Uh, but localization is not just a matter of language translation for the traditional definition, but it's how companies really localize their whole business for a market. And so I, as an example, just to show you to what extent this goes, we were speaking to a few executives at Zendesk, and they talked to us about how for, for them as a company, they're, they're headquartered in San Francisco in this neighborhood called the Tenderloin, where there are a lot of homeless people. And so... Uh, they're a very community-minded company, and so homelessness is their area of impact. And so um, when they opened an office in Singapore, the Singaporean employees were like, well, that's, that's great, but that doesn't really resonate with us because homelessness is not really a, a problem in Singapore. But I guess when you hit age 62 in, in Singapore, uh, by government mandate, you're forced into retirement. And so a lot of uh, people over that age, they, are, um, they have uh, depression, they feel isolated. And so that was an impact area that meant something to the Singaporean team. And so they localized it for that market. Next slide. The next thing that, that uh, Klaus and I are, are sharing that we came up with is this new concept that we want to socialize around what this future business leader looks like. And we call them being an entrepreneur as an in international. 
And so if you look at the pyramid on the screen, essentially the agile mindset, the bottom of the, the um, pyramid has been around for a long time, this agile mindset, entrepreneurialism. Over the last 10 or 15 years, organizations of all sizes have wanted these entrepreneurial thinkers who can operate in the context of an existing organization and deal with the bureaucracy complexity that exists there. But what hasn't been talked about as much that we think is, is gonna be the mindset that is gonna be sought after over the next decade is a cultural mindset, global mindedness, cultural curiosity, cultural sensitivity, uh, ultimately the ability to have empathy to understand and localize a business for different markets. And one of the, the, the things that we found is this is not just some concept, this is top companies are starting to do this. So companies like Shopify, Amazon, and others explicitly told us that when they're building their pipeline for their executive team, uh, you have to have international experience because they see themselves as a global business. And one of the more interesting things about the whole process that, uh, that Klaus and I had gone through in our research is hearing about the formative experiences a lot of these people who have gravitated toward international business have had. So the bottom right in, in the foreground is uh, uh, Abe Smith, who is the head of international at Zoom. And he actually taught English at a tiny Japanese fishing village. And that was really a formative experience that showed him that there was a world beyond his backyard where he lived in the East Coast of the US. Next slide. Uh, and so ultimately the final part is the how. And uh, don't worry about all these little boxes, but there's a multi-stage process we've developed that help companies go from you know, the very beginning all the way to global scale. Next slide. Uh, and a number of frameworks that help in that process as well. Next slide. Um, and so in order to be successful, uh, one of the, the main starting points that, that global class companies need to have is taking on what we call the four commitments uh, for effective expansion. So uh, these are essentially things that, that companies need to commit to in order to be successful. So starting on, and this is the uh, framing in red on the outside of this chart. So on the left, is headquarters uh, resource commitment. So giving time, uh, excuse me, resources in terms of people and funding toward your expansion initiatives. It takes much longer than you would anticipate. On the other side is autonomy and trust. So you have to give autonomy and trust to the local team to be able to identify things that need to be done to localize the business and trust them in, in the process of localizing. At the top is communication and clarity. It's so important that the headquarters and local offices are very much in constant communication and that feedback loops exist where headquarters is sharing basically uh, company culture and core values with the local teams and the local teams are sharing local market insights back with them because global cast companies understand that that the insights they can get from local markets aren't just applicable for that market, but can be great ways to improve the company across the globe. And then finally at the bottom, the, the most foundational commitment is around global agile. And, and the notion of global agile ultimately, next slide, is that you have to revisit the uh, customer discovery process that you've gone through when you're finding product market fit for your business in an initial market. You have to go through that process again when you go into new markets because your validated model is not necessarily going to work exactly the same way in another country. And so the process you take is you, you um, and, and use your favorite tool. One thing we recommend is the business model canvas uh, and, and those different quadrants, but take the validated model from the Philippines and run it through two filters. One is government and regulation and the other is culture. And then ultimately that helps you develop a new set of, um, of hypotheses that you then can go test and iterate on. Next slide. Uh, and what's really important to do and what global class companies do is they find balance between the need to localize, but also managing complexity. Next slide. Because what happens, what we found a lot of companies had done in their growth process is they, they're um, very focused on their initial market and their first international market. But then what happens is if you take this full force agile mindset uh, then all of a sudden, and customized for every market, then all of a sudden you have 10 different models that you're needing to manage. And it's very hard to manage those and create momentum and scale. Um, next slide. So, so ultimately what we did is we created a tool that we call the localization premium tool. Uh, we use the word premium because there's often a cost associated with localizing, but there's also a benefit of getting traction. And this is ultimately a holistic view on the changes that you need to make to your business in order to uh, to be able to get 
traction and product market fit in a new market. And so just to translate the, the chart, in the middle is product market fit in your home country, in, in the Philippines. But you have to deviate away from that model in order to be successful. And part of the reason we have this very um, detailed chart is because often, depending on who you're talking to, companies, uh, executives will have a very uh, myopic view. If you're in sales, you just think about sales. If you're in uh, legal, you just think about legal, marketing, et cetera. And so this helps you look at all the different facets. And so the top part are go to market strategy related, the bottom part are operational. Everything from how your marketing and sales change to how your product may change um, to on the bottom infrastructure for supply chain for physical products or tech stack for um, software products, organization change and how your um, you, whether you have to build a team or not and also differences in business culture. And then a lot of administrative things from whether you need to create new corporate entities, taxation, government regulation, things along those lines. Next slide. So just a couple of quick examples to put it into context. We got a great story from Apple as they were expanding into Brazil, because in Brazil, tariffs on electronics make an iPhone five times the price as it would normally be in the US. And so basically, Apple had to completely change their whole retail model to be more genius bar service focused and hire a new type of employee and train them very differently to be successful. Next slide. Um, another thing that, that we like to talk about is a familiarity fallacy or a proximity bias. So a lot of companies think, well, after finding fit in my initial market, I should go to another country that speaks the same language or that is geographically nearby. And this uh, case study here with Square, when they expanded to the UK and Australia, they, they found that not only did it not fit the same model they had in the US, but they were very different than each other. And Brexit in particular caused a lot of administrative premium for them. Next slide. And, uh, and then finally, one other concept is this notion of influencer markets. And, and so in speaking to a former Airbnb executive from Asia PAC, uh, she talked about how they saw Korea, which is a much smaller market, as an influencer for Japan and China, because Japanese and Chinese consumers often look to Koreans for the next hot thing. And so by them localizing for the Korean market, next slide, when they went, then went into Japan and China after, they didn't incur too much complexity because of the order in which they had done things and they were able to scale much faster. Next slide. Uh, there's also a you know, great case study we found around Canva that was a company that was built to be uh, global, global class from day one, from their ability to localize their product with language translation and different templates and iconography that fit different markets to uh, a team at their headquarters in Sydney that speaks over 70 language say, uh, amongst two or 300 employees. And uh, they universalized their core values in a way that really appealed uh, worldwide. Next slide. And uh, in, in addition to the book that we're doing and sharing this content, we realized that while the entrepreneurial community is very well connected, this international business community is less so because often expanding to new countries is a very solitary exercise. Um, you know, people, you're the one person sent to that new market to go launch it, or you're the one person hired in that market that's apart from headquarters. And so we're building a community to make it more of a shared experience. Presentation, like you have mentioned, you know, there are four essential commitments to be successful. You have the HQ resource commitment, and then you have the autonomy and trust communications and clarity and global agile. Okay, thank you. So I'd like to ask if everyone is still okay, are we feeling good? We still have a lot to do, so let us not wait any further. But before that, I'd like to call on our judges if they are already here. Um, Sir, uh, Sir James, and then uh, Sir Aru, are you there? Uh, Sir Carlo, Sir Eve, Mam Ma Dayan, and Mam Ma Says. Okay, if if the judges are here, may we start the um, second uh, second pitching session? Okay, may we have the video pitch of Insight. Crypto. Hi, I'm Ramel Jinpaiba, 
co-founder and biz dev for Inside Crypto. And our team's goal is to make crypto trading accessible and profitable for everyone. The problem that we want to solve, something that we personally experienced, is how to survive and thrive in cryptocurrency trading. Most people don't have the time or the funds to learn what they need to successfully and safely trade cryptocurrency. Without doing due diligence, it is easy to get burned or fall for emotionally driven trading that often results in disaster. Emotions like fear, uncertainty, and doubt, also known as FUD. And let's not forget, greed. If you ask people who have traded manually, they will tell you about the times they would spend staring at the screen, trying to time the market, looking for possible entries or exits. Our solution is a customizable trading bot that will automatically buy and sell cryptocurrency for the user on the Binance platform. According to Business Insider, as of January this year, more than 100 million people around the world are now using cryptocurrencies. With a global market cap of $2.79 trillion, there is a large enough market to go around. And as for the Philippines, it is estimated that over 4.3 million Filipinos currently own cryptocurrency. Our solution is easy to set up and use. And here we see the actual screen of the trading bot prototype. This is my personal account where I'm running several bots at the same time, trading different pairs so I can diversify my earnings. During our beta test round in the second quarter of this year, our users had a combined earning of more than $11,000. Here we have some user testimonies. Two seafarers who have no time to learn trading or monitor their investments. Our business model is simple. Get 10% from the profit of each trade that we will bill our users every month. We have started development late last year and testing early this year. With the completion of our prototype, there is ongoing development for more features and performance improvements. We set our sights on having our own token that we can list in exchanges for trading or for investors to buy and hold on to. Of course, we have considered the legal requirements set by the BSP and SEC for us to have a successful token offering later on. The token will also be used for future projects such as partnering with merchants that will use the token as currency. By getting more paying users, funding or investments, direct or via token, we plan to grow the team by hiring more devs for continuous development and maintenance. We will get community managers, fund managers, and more traders to further improve our strategies to maximize trade profit while minimizing risks. If you want to be a part of this exciting venture, you may reach us here or through our social media channels. Thank you for your time. Again, this is Rumel Jun Paiba for Inside Crypto, and we hope to see you one day trading successfully by using our bots and buying our token. Thank you, Inside Crypto. Now we will proceed with the question and answer. Sir Carlo. Hi, thank you so much for the presentation. I'm gonna I'm gonna come out strong on this question since this is a governmental grant and competition um, crypto is definitely needs to be regulated especially when it comes to transactions and and taxes how are you going to tackle that especially when you're talking about trading bots um, there's a lot of possible malicious intent that could happen especially in your platform well thank you for that question we actually prepared for that uh, according to the BSP circular this January 2021, they only regulate four uh, activities for those who intend to offer services regarding to virtual assets. Uh, one is the exchange between virtual assets or fiat currencies. Two is exchange between one or more forms of virtual assets. And three, transfer of virtual assets. And four is the safekeeping and or administration of VAs enabling control over other virtual assets. And since we are operating on the virtual platform, uh, the platform of Binance, we do not fall under the four regulations of BSP. As for taxation, according to Taxumo, uh, taxes can only be levied on the operations of income generating activities if they are converted to fiat, from crypto to fiat. So again, in this uh, aspect, we are not yet regulated or covered, but just in case, we will be looking at possible regulation later on so that we can, of course, uh, 
register properly with the SEC and PIR. So first, as for now, we are not yet covered by the regulations of BSP or the SEC. And I hope that answers the question. Questions from the other judges? Um, Sir Arup? Yeah, uh, my question is, I mean, this whole crypto trading is highly speculative. And uh, it got my attention when you mentioned about, you know, trying to get seafarers and others to get into this kind of trading. I mean, it's not illegal, but where does it cross the ethical line, I guess, is the question, isn't it? Because they obviously don't know what they're getting into. Yeah, so for this one, let me answer these questions. So actually, we just don't offer this to seafarers. Actually, our primary uh, target are Filipinos or any users that are planning to join the crypto space but doesn't know how or being misled by these scams uh, around the world. It was just uh, a, also an opportunity that, that some seafarers actually invested in our uh, platform. So... What we do is that we don't usually just offer something like this. We also offer other educational uh, trainings about this one or informative. We also build communities around this one so that uh, because here in the trading, uh, in trading, we don't want to be alone. And it's a lot easier to trade if you have a community that you can ask, you can share ideas and something like that. So for, for the question of ethical or crossing the line, I think... Uh, as long as we don't endanger uh, some sort or someone, I think it's all good or fair in the crypto space. But yeah, we, we, we have the goal to educate our users, of course. Thank you, Sir Arup. And then, Sir James, you have a question. Yes, um, it, it's not about um, crypto per se, it's more about your user base. My impression of people that get into crypto are people that are attracted by no fee trading, but they're also, they perceive themselves to be independent and free thinkers. Do you think there will be the uptake from that, from a market for an automatic trading bot? Sorry, can you repeat that uh, question? Yeah, do you think, um, given the characteristics of people that get into crypto and that they, they're independent, they believe in, um, you know, free thinking and, and other approaches, do you think that that sits with a demand for a, an automatic trading bot? Uh, yeah, so uh, for this one, we don't really intend to replace trading as a whole uh, with the, our automations. So what we aim is to be a support or a like assistance to the uh, traders uh, themselves. Because like the seafarers, they actually like our service because they can only connect to the internet once a month. So what they do mostly is just invest and invest. But crypto space is very volatile. So you need to compete with the market or go with it. So a 24-7 running uptime trading bot is can greatly support you. Uh, it's just a, a assistance. We, we don't push that you go all in on this one. So you can diversify your portfolio, uh, like I mentioned before, so that at, at least uh, you, don't, you don't get left behind or like, for example, if you don't have time to open up, uh, it's still ongoing on the process. Uh, I hope I, I answered your question. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, I think, uh, Sir A, do you have a question? Sorry. Yeah. Um, in terms of the automation or type of analysis that you're doing, um, what kind of automation have you actually done? Uh, yeah, so the automation is fully buy and sell uh, using the trading bot on the Binance platform. We offer four types of 
uh, risk appetites or behavior on the bots, namely passive, conservative, moderate, and aggressive being the top one. So we really can't disclose on how we do the analysis, but uh, it's more of a numbers crunching. And uh, yeah, we, we uh, depending on, on the risk appetite that you choose, uh, the behavior of the bot will also depend. All right. Maybe last follow up on that. Um, what average returns were you able to see the performance of the bot? Oh, yeah. So last last May twenty twenty one this year, uh, we actually had our beta beta round. So for around twenty five to thirty users, uh, for one month, uh, all users totaled up again of uh, around eleven thousand dollars plus. So, so after how the much beta round, oh, yeah. So it was around. Uh, hundred percent per user, and more. Because some of the user we uh, invested around hundred dollars to two hundred dollars minimum, and they doubled their money at that time. But at the time it was bullish. It was a bullish market. I don't I don't want to say any guarantee, but for a downward market like the previous months, uh, our current percentages are around thirty to fifty percent for a month. Uh, the down the downturn. Yeah. Okay, thank you, Inside Crypto. May we uh, uh, call on our next finalist? May we have the video pitch of Say Yes? On what was supposed to be the best day of her life, this bride was left in tears after being scammed by her wedding planner. This was her reaction after she got to her reception venue just to find out that it was closed and the wedding coordinator unreachable. What happened to this bride is not an isolated case. In fact, thousands of couples get scammed every year by wedding suppliers. Just as worse, wedding suppliers get scammed by couples who refuse to pay for their services too. There's no wonder why couples stress out for over a year for an event that lasts just one day. Introducing Say Yes. Say Yes innovatively connects couples with vendors to take the stress away from inefficient wedding planning. You discover ideas like in Pinterest, you book wedding suppliers like Grab, and suppliers can bid on projects just like Upward. Our couples start with a Pinterest-style feed and create their own custom dream packages, mixing different suppliers called an inspo board. Once they're ready, the bidding system gets all relevant vendors to bid on their wedding so they can find the best deals. Lastly, for security, they can pay through the platform to guarantee service delivery with our secure escrow system. Say Yes helps vendors by helping them showcase their work to appeal to a wider audience, thereby increasing their sales and having a secure way to lock in contracts. And this is great for small-time suppliers because they can bid on a variety of projects, creating a fair marketplace for all. Lastly, vendors are guaranteed payments for the work that they do. Look, weddings are times when people are emotionally willing to spend a lot. In the Philippines, with roughly 400,000 marriages and an average spend per wedding of 200,000 pesos, that's an 80 billion peso per year market. However, the number of registered marriages were cut in half in 2020 because of the pandemic. That's only 240,000 marriages compared to the usual 400,000. We're projecting about the same number for 2021. This is why now is the perfect time to get a head start on this business because couples are delaying their weddings, which creates a backlog for 2022 and beyond. Currently, the competition serving this growing market focuses on being a directory, but you still have to do all the heavy lifting to discover, compare, negotiate, and pay offline. With Say Yes, we're going to be the only platform that has everything you need in one place, uses a recommendation algorithm that learns from your activity, and fills your feed with things you forgot like your giveaways or the invites. It lets you invite relatives to leave comments on vendors with fam collab, and with smart bid, couples can pick a vendor, big or small, that fits their budget. Our revenue model is simple. We take 10% of every payment done through our platform. With this, couples enjoy event insurance and a concierge while vendors are assured payments. We're the best team to do this because we're not only engineers who run our own individual businesses, but we also happen to be couples that have been through the tedious process of planning weddings. Once we acquire funding of 10 million pesos, we have a six month roadmap to gain traction. Our initial goal is to have a fully functioning platform with 20,000 users, 100 suppliers, and 30 paid bookings in the city of Cebu, Mandawa, and Lapu Lapu. Together, let's say yes to removing wedding stress, say yes to helping wedding suppliers affected by the pandemic, and say yes to the future of the wedding industry. Thank you, say yes. Now the floor is open for the five minute question and answer, judges. Sir Abe? 
Um, are there any pre-product validation that you were able to do? Any offline transactions that you were able to uh, facilitate? No, this is a purely ideation, um, yeah, startup. Okay. Hi. Uh, you have a uh, lot of questions, Sir Abe? Yeah. Um, none. Okay. Sir James, sorry. It's your yeah, turn. No, this, given it's an ideation concept, um, there's been a number of attempts at doing this market in the Philippines. I mean, it, it's, a, it's a great market space, but there's been a number of attempts. And I can't tell you why they failed, but have you looked into why they haven't succeeded? What do you need to do different to there's some issue in the market that that's preventing success people to finding the traction they need have you looked into that yeah so i think um uh, from our research what we've seen is that most competitors try to be a directory and they don't try to make it very easy for the user to actually transact and have a safe place so most solutions in the philippines right now are just static directories where people manually list um suppliers and you're supposed to search them. There's no real end-to-end -end platform, just like our video said, that really combines everything from discovery, just like Pinterest, um, you know, finding suppliers, just like Grab. And lastly, um, you know, uh, bidding on projects, just like a platform like Upwork. And um, just because of the pandemic and how it's pushed forward digital transactions, we believe it's a good time uh, to really break this industry, um, break into this industry. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, thank you, Sir James. Uh, Ma'am Diane, you have questions? Nan? Okay. Uh, same, same as James' question. Ah, okay. Uh, other question from the judges? Nan? Okay. Uh, Ma'am says? Can I just ask, who among you is the tech person? Who's going? That would be, be Reynard, the uh, guy wearing white. <laughs> And your background is you've 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 because you were mentioning about the whole bidding thing makes sense, but that's a lot of backend. Oh, so, yeah, so um, you know, we believe that there are a lot of talented Filipinos out there, and just like in the uh, talks right before this one, that you know, with the go, you know. The Oh, his audio is out. All right, direction. Um, so, so yeah, so that's something that I believe can be figured out um, from a technical standpoint. Okay, thank you. Okay, sir, Arup. Uh, I'm wondering if you have spoken with the um, suppliers because, you know, I mean, if your assumption is correct, which I assume is correct, uh, that there's going to be a huge backlog and, and there's huge demand. What is their incentive to go online, try something new, something different, while they're already inundated with demand? Why would they join your platform? Yeah, so there are a couple of answers to that. Um, actually, yeah. One of our team members, Veronica, is actually a wedding coordinator. And so she's very connected with the supplier space and uh, Cebu and Visayas. So um, I'll have her answer. But one thing that we would add is through our platform, there will be portfolios and reviews and it will create a fair marketplace for all. So a lot of smaller suppliers, they will be incentivized to join our platform because we'll make marketing so much easier for them, right? So much easier for them to connect uh, with a lot of people. So yeah, that's one thing. And also, yeah. you know, yeah, there is guaranteed service payment. So I'm not sure if you've seen the news. There are a lot of suppliers that have been scammed, right? So us as an escrow, you know, as, as we keep the money, we get to secure those payments for them, thereby adding another layer of, you know, incentive for them, right? Okay, thank you very much. Team say yes. Yes, we will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the BG pitch of Team Lift. The COVID-19 pandemic has caused the grounding of the majority of commercial aviation and airport operations. While most educational institutions are able to shift to study from home and online learning for the general population, the needs of the relatively smaller number of students in aviation training remain largely unaddressed because of highly technical 
and hands-on learning requirements. Due to limited local availability and rising prices of flight training equipment, students and professional pilots who use PC-based flight simulators often resort to using keyboard and mouse or combinations thereof. Evidently, the hand movements a pilot makes when using keyboard and mouse combinations in simulator training do not translate well to actual flight, especially for crucial emergency procedures. Adapting from rated simulators used and required by industry standards, we solve this kinesis problem with the Lightweight Instrument Flight Trainer, or LIFT. It is a compact procedural training device resembling a flight instrument panel of a real aircraft. In conjunction with flight simulation software such as Microsoft Flight Simulator, Lockheed Martin P3D, Laminar Research X-Plane 10 and 12, the LIFT console provides tangibility and an appreciable likeness with actual aircraft giving pilots in training the muscle memory that is usually learned from industry-rated simulators, thereby bridging the gap between simulated flight training at home and actual flight in the cockpit. As quickly as lockdown hit the aviation industry, so will the ramping up as we enter post-COVID recovery normalization of flight operations. It takes at least $10,000 US dollars and an average of two years to go through flight training and that does not guarantee gaining a pilot license. In contrast, it only takes six months to order and deliver an aircraft once the orders are firm. This translates to a rapid aging of the pre-COVID pilot roster pool that a new batch of emerging pilots must fill in. Even with aggressive rehiring measures, pilot shortage has been projected by several airlines and key players in the aviation industry. This is an opportunity that current aspiring student pilots can realistically attain but only if they are able to prove themselves beyond their theories. A real challenge in the study from home environment. Our aviation training devices translate better into the cockpit as student pilots go through actual flying time. The kinesis experience is also remarkably better as compared to practicing using mouse, keyboards, and touchscreens, which are by far the viable alternatives to compete with. While there are more advanced options that can be acquired, the time, technical skill set required, and sheer price difference makes it unrealistic for individuals. To begin with, those aviation training devices were designed for institutions and the kind of budget that it entails. This means that even in post-COVID recoveries, our devices are viable to stay and may even pave the way for the study at home for the aviation training industry. With our flagship IFR trainer, we aim to equip the next generation of Filipino pilots with cutting-edge flight training technology at home preparing them for the recovery of the aviation job market in the post-pandemic world. This is LIFT. Ergon Aviation as a sole intellectual property holder of LIFT IFR. We would like to inform the judges that the video pitch of Team LIFT was cut because they exceeded the limit of the allowable time. We will now proceed to the question and answer portion. Judges. Good afternoon. Sir Eve? All right. Yes. Um, are there any discussions currently being done with CAP? Yes. With regards to the we actually or, I, quality? I already have a CAP approved uh, simulator that's endemically made here in Cebu. So are we assuming that this this, this same product is, um, if they undergo the same training, this qualifies them for CAP licensure? Yes. Got it. All right. Maybe if I could uh, add. I actually um, have a device um, here. If you can see here. <laughs> OK. Uh, yeah, I that. guess um, so the, the price point that uh, you're looking at, it's what's actually going to be cheaper than what's in the gaming market that's being uh, that's being sold by Logitech. And Logitech cannot be cannot be used as a training device, nor can it be approved in CAP, but ours can be. So to clarify, it's already accredited. Okay, so the patent is already filed. Uh, here's the problem with it: is that we want to assign it to UP. We've, we've already sent the documents. It's under it's now a patented product, but under the license of UP. 
So you have to talk to them if you want to ever acquire or get licensure from it. Wait. So your business does not hold the IP? We do. Um, there's five. There's actually five patentable products. Only one of which we was we assigned to UP. The reason was because we were approached by really large corporations, um, the traditional brick and mortar corporations, and and it would kill our product. It would just, it would destroy our product basically because we want to help the uh, we actually want to help friends. I have friends, my pilots who are discriminated right now. I have friends who are students. I have friends who are flight instructors, and this this helps them. I actually sold five of these devices, but I had to refund it because uh, DOST told me that I had to patent it first before I sold it. So we're we're in a we're in a we have to ha we have to navigate this market very very carefully. Okay. It sounds, I, uh, sorry, it sounds like you need some advice, but my question would be more about your customer market. Is there a reason you wouldn't target hobbyists as well? It seems like it would be a much actually, it does. larger cash-rich um, market in the it Central does. America. It actually leverages the hobbyist market and gamer market to lower the price point. That's how, that's how we, that, that's kind of like the, one of the trade secrets of how we're able to democratize the aviation education by leveraging and tapping a market that would help in the mass production and mass sale of these kinds of products and, and make it more affordable for, for the aviation industry as well. And where will you mass produce in the Philippines? Yeah, we already have a, we already granted by the OSDP shared um, around 1,000 square meters of floor space where we have to, we have to retool it first, but it's all 3D printed. It's next generation production uh, and it's, not, it's quite easy to upscale. How many do you think you can produce per year, and uh, what sort Affordably, of Affordably, we can do it uh, like two thousand five hundred up to ten thousand, depending on how many three D printers we're gonna pop, we're gonna buy. But uh, ten thousand is about the limit, and add one thousand square meters of floor space. And what's your margin per unit? The margin is about forty percent, almost. Thank you. Okay. Maybe if I may follow up from uh, James, um, at what price point are we looking at? If we're looking at 40% 40, 40 margins. Yes. Uh, 60,000 sale would mean that we could grow it at about a rate of 12% per, per year over 10 years cumulatively. So basically, if there's a 131 million investment, that would mean that we could grow uh, another 200, 278 million. In ten years, it's twelve percent annually, on average. I think you're hiding the good story in your pitch. So there's a lot of things I'm trying to hide, actually, because uh, no, I'm not, we're scared not things, because of the sea of the big corporations. Yeah. Okay. There was a reason that we we had to assign our IP to UP, the first IP. Because it's the only way we could protect it. Legally, they're, they're large corporations. They can just maybe harass us until we sell it. Okay. Uh, other questions from the judges? Ma'am Diane? Yeah, it's just really a comment that if you, know, you have uh, something more valuable to protect um it doesn't add value if you come out to a public uh, event like this so i think it's a message just not not only for this team but for other teams as well okay so here's the thing it's valuable for the philippines because it helps us tap into untapped uh, raw talent it's not as valuable if you think about it on a corporate world for us like these are our friends uh, we we want to help them, but if we give it to a large corporation and then and then they'll say that it can compete with another product that's priced at around fifteen thousand U.S. dollars. That's our closest mar uh, our closest competitor, by the way, is Redbird TD2, which is about four hundred thousand pesos, and we're selling this at sixty thousand. You can just imagine how much they can actually put on top of this, and that's probably why they approached us. 
So, but that kills our mission. Our mission is to help because in recovery, okay, so there's a, it's a problem. Out of practice airline pilots are making errors back in the air. COVID has meant months of out of the cockpit. As countries begin to open up, mid-air mistakes are mounting. And this is actually on Bloomberg. This is, that's an actual quote. I'm not making that up and you can pull it right now. Okay. Thank you very much, judges. So if you don't have, have any questions, thank you again. Team Leaf, right. we will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the video pitch of Team Peitaka. Hello, everyone. I'm Aaron. And I'm Jomar. And we're from Team Paitaka. We have more than 110 million inhabitants and 93% own smartphones. The Philippines is growing fast in terms of digital technology, social media, and usage of new technology. Despite the exponential growth, the Philippines lag behind most of its ASEAN partners. As you can see, <clears throat> we lag behind these countries in connectivity and speed. And as the COVID-19 pandemic continues, the Philippine government encourages all businesses to shift to cashless payments and transactions. Pitaka aims to create a safe and secure e-wallet system to tackle two problem areas or pain points that we see in the, in the Philippines. First, there's the need for a secure cashless payment system. And second, um, we need to address the slow and intermittent internet connection nationwide. And how do we solve that? First, Pitaka's e-wallet app is blockchain-based and it's non-custodial. Second, the Pitaka wallet app can facilitate transactions even if the pay and payer are both offline. As mentioned earlier, the Philippines has 110 million inhabitants and most of them own smartphones. So the potential market for Pitaka is very huge and the potential for our growth is inevitable. The Paytaka team is comprised of professionals in their respective industries and united with the common goal to make cashless payments available to the masses. I'm Jomar, I'm the CEO. I'm a research scientist by training, but have uh, turned into a technopreneur. Dr. Michael Machita is our CFO. He's been a long-time banker and accountant. And I'm Aaron Almadro. I'm the marketing director, and I have an extensive background in media and marketing. Uh, we have a team of developers and team of marketing staff that help us develop these uh, programs and apps that we're developing. Our competitors are Gcash, PyMaya, and Coins.ph. And to mention, these competitors of ours are non-blockchain based and they both require internet connection to be used for payment. So we aim to keep merchant fees low uh, compared to our competitors. And we expect our bigger source of revenue will be from services that we will build on top of the payment system. For example, we build an e-commerce platform, or marketplace, we use a payment system for remittance, to for insurance and payroll, etc. The short-term plan is to add cryptocurrency support, as we have started with Bitcoin Cash already, and SOP tokens, and we'll provide a way to exchange BCH with local currency through the app. So we can promote the usage of this use as a payment option in brick and mortar shops in our region in Eastern size. The long term plan is to promote the BCH as a payment option nationwide, to use it for remittance, and to comply with regulations in the Philippines in order to secure a license to, to operate, and then build more services on top of the wallet uh, payment app and open it up to other developers. Our current status in funds is basically bootstrapping. So uh, I hope you can help us help our region and maybe soon the rest of the Philippines. Okay, as I mentioned earlier, uh, we got the video pitch of the Team Taka because of they exceeded the allowable time. Okay, judges, you may... Sir Abe? Um, what was the decision on why uh, the Bitcoin Cash infrastructure was used amongst um, all the other blockchain technologies available? Yeah, um, we, we chose Bitcoin Cash because um, among the, the, uh, the top cryptocurrencies, it is the most suitable for um, 
payments because it's uh, it has maintained low fees and it has a bigger capacity uh, than Bitcoin in terms of processing uh, a number of transactions. So yeah, because our goal is really to uh, make uh, crypto available for payments in as many places as possible because we believe that's the original vision of Satoshi Nakamoto when he invented Bitcoin. Okay, but then what, uh, what other protocols were you able to explore if you're looking at transaction speed and uh, the fee? Uh, yeah, and fees. If that's the main consideration, I don't think Bitcoin Cash is the best option for that. Um, there are other things we needed to consider. Um, for example, the liquidity in uh, exchanges. So most of the exchanges in, in many countries, they support uh, Bitcoin, Bitcoin Cash, Ethereum, Light, Litecoin. And so the fact that uh, Bitcoin Cash is more universally accepted among the low-fee uh, cryptocurrencies uh, is another consideration. And another thing also I need to mention is that um, I, I've been involved in the Bitcoin Cash community. So I have built projects uh, for Bitcoin Cash uh, since 2019. And I have a good uh, reputation in the BCH community and I can rally the support of whales if needed to support this startup and our initiatives. Sir Aaron, right. for the next question. I'm trying to understand. So basically, or simplifying it, it's the uh, it's same as coins.ph, um, but it can work offline. Is that is my understanding correct? Um, there's a more fundamental difference between us and the coins at PH. Namely, um, we designed Paytaka to be non-custodial, which means that um, the private key uh, is stored in the device. We are not storing it in the server. And um, it's, a, it's also a philosophical difference in a way because uh, we believe that the control of money or crypto should be in the hands of uh, the users and not in any exchange or a third party institution because yeah, it has that's it, it has its own pros and cons basically if they lose the phone the money is gone uh while on the coins it stays on the server but yeah i mean that's a different but how will it work without connecting to the internet um yes the way bitcoin blockchain works and also bitcoin cash being a fork of bitcoin is that every 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 value you receive in bitcoin cash is stored in a in a sort of a receipt it's called a unspent transaction output it's basically just a piece of data a string which can be stored uh offline and the way you spend it is you unlock it by signing uh, the dig digital signature with the private key which lives in the device so this can be perfectly done on offline and the verification also on the receiving side of the transaction can verify this offline although that will mean that we not we need we can we should delay the the broadcast to the blockchain up until a certain time when either of the parties connect to the internet so they do have to connect it's just basically you're saying um it's it's not immediately right so uh there's uh, like offline mode uh, yeah there's a while while the wallet is is online this this unspent transaction outputs are downloaded regularly uh, when the user inquires balance for example and these uh, are stored so when the device goes offline they can only spend this stored utxos in the device okay so they will have to go online before the transaction becomes official and they can spend the money but at least there's an option okay got it yes thank you sir aru uh, I would like to ask the other judges if you have questions. Okay, if not, thank you, Team, team Paytaka. Thank you. May I call on to our next finalist? May we have the big pitch of Team Click. Have you ever heard of safety first is safety always? Big difference later. How do you keep your family safe? 
Do you give them cell phones so that in times of emergencies, they can contact you? How many minutes does it take a person or a kid to compose a text message? 10 seconds? 20? 1 minute? Within that time, anything could have happened already. Within that time, they can lose their life. There is a way to at least relay faster text messages without opening and typing in your cell phones. It is a proactive action that will relay a message in less than 5 seconds. Let me introduce to you, Click. It is a handy device connected to your cell phone via Bluetooth. The application allows you to pre-record templated messages that is manually operated through clicking motion. The number of repeated clicks determines the message to be sent. For example, one click will send for help. Two click calls someone. The device can both send messages and call for someone. Once the message or call was sent, the system via SMS will send the current location of the sender using GPS locator. Let's get prepared ahead with this wireless device that will allow us to provide security and ensure the life-saving information dissemination can be done quickly. Children, disabled people, Elders and handicapped individuals were mainly the focus that inspired the creation of this device. They will no longer fear emergencies for they will now have the means to contact a family member or a friend when a need arises. Their safety will never be a second choice when this device is in your and their hands. This will be their one-click way to safety device. We will never gamble their safety. So be prepared, make an emergency plan, and leave. Thank you, Click. We will now proceed with a question and answer from our judges. Sir Arup? Uh, what's the business model? It's a subscription, is it? Uh, the ones who wants to use it? Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, judges. Uh, it's a simple device that you acquire and uh, download an apps wherein you can pair your cell phones and to a device. So there should be an existing... Uh, so it's a one-time sale of a uh, uh, device, is it? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you must have a subscription uh, using uh, the existing ISP or other uh, communication telephone. Uh, subscription to internet and, and phone service, you mean, right? Or uh, subscription to your click? No, sir. Uh, just only a subscription from the telecom. The, the device can only uh, be used if you have a uh, load, of course, or postpaid, wherein the device will trigger on a certain application that should be installed in your smartphone. So and how speed, much are you looking at? So this is like a Bluetooth device um, that you sell for a certain price in the market. And um, how will you how will you stop it being copied and sold in Lazada and other places? You know. Okay, the market of this, uh, according to the statistics, uh, there are around uh, 89 million smartphone users in the Philippines. And there are around 1.4 million disabled persons. And this is uh, a big, a huge uh, market. If we just sell the device in $1, and we can capture around 10% of the device, I'm pretty sure we can get our ROI this investment. No, I, I don't have a doubt about the potential use of it and the need for it but what i'm trying to understand is you know since it's just a it's a device that you build uh and someone can copy it i mean you know after you sell the first thousand uh someone can actually build it 
from a mass producer and rebrand and sell it as e-click and uh, you cannot really protect it isn't it Actually, in the philippines we can have a that's the, that's the only way that we can secure this or the patent but uh, in in some cases in abroad uh, perhaps it's very hard for us to keep track uh, with the prototype if we are going to outsource uh, this device to a certain company uh, but pretty sure we can we can have a patent here in the philippines perhaps maybe in uh, international but i don't have an idea on that but here in the philippines we have patent and copyright Okay, thank you. Thank you, Sir Aru. Other qu uh, questions from our judges? Mom says you have questions, Paul. Okay, so if there's none. Okay, if there's none, I'd like to thank the, thank the team click. And then we will proceed to the next finalist. May we have the video pitch of Team Ofudi. Welcome to Ofudi. My name is J.M. Libero, the CEO and co-founder. Food and beverage industry is one of the slowest to adapt to technology. And what we see in the market is the lack of ecosystem because MSMEs need to subscribe to multiple platforms to gain access to technology. This is Mark. He owns a restaurant and a small hotel. He wants to digitize his restaurant to get more customers and is looking for an app to help his business. However, he wants to manage everything on his own to maintain quality and he already has his own delivery rider. Mark subscribes to Ofudi. He starts managing everything through the app with our order management system, from uploading the menu to managing incoming orders, preparing food and delivery fulfillment by deploying his own delivery rider. Everything is self-service and he manages it independently. But he also has an option to subscribe to Ofudi Delivery Fulfillment, where we have a special feature of combining orders from a cluster of different restaurants into one single transaction. That means one delivery fee and one delivery wait time. And then he reopened his business for dining customers and activated the Ofudi table service. When his customers visit, they don't need to call the wait staff. All they have to do is scan the QR code to access the interactive menu, and their order goes directly to the cashier and kitchen. When the food is ready, the staff knows exactly what table to serve because the app has its table identifier, making the whole process safe, contactless, and it reduces the margin of error for the restaurant. Mark also activates the feature for his hotel and serves their guests wherever they are, including the room without the need to call the front desk or the kitchen. All of this, done in one single app. These features differentiate us from the market as popular features of the apps are focused on delivery segment while Ofudi is modular and customizable depending on the need of your business. Currently, we have over 3,000 users, 80 partner restaurants, and we are in partnership with two SMOs. We also have two hotels in the pipeline in their final stages of testing. We have streamlined our target market and we reach them through offline and online strategies. And our business model is based on monthly subscription through SaaS. This makes Ofudi scalable. To make this happen, our team is composed of a technical founder, an enthusiast of market and business trends, and experience in branding and operations management. Our strategy is to build our expertise on the phase one of the project. With hundreds of restaurants on our belt, phase two is disrupting supply chain through e-commerce and direct distribution from manufacturer to restaurant as well as food safety. To support MSMEs further to grow their business, Phase 3 is incorporating fintech through manufacturer credit lines and short-term low-interest loan, and a big dream of Cloud Kitchen at Phase 4. We need your help to reach our milestones through support and investment to scale fast, build a team further to develop the product, and a big marketing push that will bring us to our first 100,000 users, 5,000 merchants, and 100 hotels next year. Thank you very much. Ofudi team, now we will proceed with a question and answer. Sir Aru. Hi. So I'm trying to understand. Um, yeah, there were 
there are certain features that you clearly so basically in a way you are an alternative not really a competitor to um, to like the food panda and grab isn't it and yes. uh, your business model is uh, subscription compared to getting a cart so what may so how many restaurants did you say are using it um we already have 80 restaurants but the phase one of the project is that uh we did not have the uh subscription model right away what we did um uh, is the delivery platform first because that's what the market needed uh the 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 app was initially built as a subscription model but the market needed the delivery space when the pandemic started so we did the um cloud kitchen type of delivery and we do have 15% cut from or 15% increase from the price. So the difference of the delivery as well is that we we pay the merchants um cash 100%. So they get all the revenue and then we increase the app price by 15%. That's where we do get the revenue in that model. Now we're moving on to the space where in we are doing the SaaS subscription which is uh 500 pesos per uh, merchant. but that is only if they hit 2500 revenue per month from our platform so that makes it a win-win situation uh for both of us why would uh, what, what is the motivation of the um stores restaurants to use you over the other uh grab and uh, and food panda right I agree. Um so the difference is that we pay cash compared to uh the other platforms where in their revenue models that they are being paid after 15 days or per cut off. That's one because if you're an MSME, you tend to roll your capital uh to buy to buy supplies. The other piece is that they take uh 20 to 30 35% cut from your margin while for us we pay the merchants 100% when we pick up the item the the 15% is uh shouldered by the consumer in that sense but comparing to the other platforms we are still relatively cheaper because the platform is at 15% but really uh the app is not just a delivery platform what we do is provide the restaurants the platform so they can subscribe on a monthly basis and even run their business without subscribing to our delivery say you're a restaurant and you have your own delivery rider you can just subscribe to the platform and then run your own uh business that makes us scalable in a sense because wherever you are in the philippines or maybe outside the country as long as there is an internet you can subscribe and use ofd uh, as a platform So when I uh, I I have a little bit of experience in this segment and uh, whenever you talk to this um retailers or restaurants the reason they go for any of this is because it's supposed to bring them more business uh, okay. rather than the convenience or anything and um that is where all the cost lies in bringing the market and that's the reason players like grab and food panda is still running in loss right after such a huge size and all so it's a very cash intensive business um i'm just trying to understand how how this will go because once you go on a saas model you're depending on them to get their own customer hence the benefit of the platform goes away but if you try to compete on the same ground where you're trying to grow the business for them it's expensive and you lose money how how do you see to solve this right so one of the things that we do is that we have the on premise uh, as an additional uh service that we're providing for them it's not just a platform for delivery we also have an on premise where so do they now care? that do sorry? they care about the do they care about the on prem um not a lot but the hotels that we're working with they are the ones that are very um interested on this because it not just helps their um restaurant but also the whole uh, hotel itself for uh in room uh, or room service so that's a whole different segment from the restaurant altogether and and it might work i mean you know you can create a concierge kind of a model uh digital concierge for uh, hotels but that's a different business than the one you are in 
Um, well, that's already part of where we're going right now. But specific to, to answer your question in the restaurant uh, itself, um, what we're doing is we're providing a, a solution for areas wherein it can't be reached by Grab or, or Food Panda. The thing is, they only operate where they have an office or uh, a base or a, uh, an operation, base operation. These areas were in, there are um, smaller cities and um, location. They have internet connectivity, but they do not have these platforms because there are, I mean, it can't be reached by, by these uh, aggregators or, or uh, delivery like, companies. But you're saying it's like a Shopee, uh, kind of, not Shopee, sorry, uh, Shopify for... Kind uh, of. Artists. Uh, for order management, right. So it's providing the restaurants, even outside the key cities, the ability to manage their order and digitize their business and have it run. And the thing is, it will be an additional uh, task for the restaurant to market their own, but it provides them the ability to digitize their business and take orders uh, instead of going, you know, taking orders over the phone, uh, Facebook, and, and all the other platforms. Thank you for, for the questions. Okay. Thank you, Sir Aru. Other questions from the judges? None? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Team OFD. We will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the BJ pitch of Team Prelom. Good day, everyone. I am Ken Oi, the founder of Prelom. I hope everyone is well amidst this pandemic that we are facing. I am very happy to share to you a product we invented for the new normal. WHO and DOH keeps on reminding us, in order to stop or lessen the spread of COVID-19, we must wear our mask, maintain social distancing, and always wash our hands. These three simple reminders will help lower the spread of COVID-19, and yet among the three, hand washing or hand hygiene is the hardest to follow. We have identified several reasons why it is very hard to follow proper hand hygiene. First, lacking of hand washing facility in public areas. Time consuming. Before you can reach the restroom, you have to touch countless doorknobs and the risk of infection increases. Alcohol-based hand sanitizer cause dryness of skin, rushes, and long-term health problems. So we created an innovative solution to answer these problems and promote proper hand hygiene by combining the convenience of hand sanitizer and the effectivity of traditional soap and water. I present to you the No Rinse Foaming Hand Wash. This hand wash is proven to kill 99.9 .9 of germs tested already by the USD, leaves protective barrier for longer protection against germs, infused with coconut derivatives that moisturizes your hands, pH balance through litmus test, just like water. It is patentable, no water or alcohol needed to clean your hands, safe for frequent use, convenient and no rinse. It has three fragrances to choose from. In order to help educate the public regarding the programs of the government regarding COVID-19, we added QR code that would direct them to our page where they can see information from DOH and IFTF. They can also see by scanning the QR code refilling station near them. Business opportunities if they wish to distribute the product. Since the launching of the product, we have reached as far as Ilocos Norte and the Zamboanga Peninsula. We know we still need to reach more people and more places. We have partnered with individuals who are looking for additional income in this time of pandemic. So as you can see, most of our sales came from distributors. These are our customer reviews. If you wish to know more about the product or partner with us, kindly scan this QR code using your smartphones. Thank you and keep safe. Thank you, Team Prolom. I'm, I'm sorry, Prelom. We will now proceed with the questions from the judges.
judges. Sir Arup. So how, what is the end game here? You're looking at, um, you know, building up the product brand and then trying to get a bigger company to buy it out. Is that how it goes? Like livers or someone? Cannot hear you, sorry. I think you're mute, sir. Hello, good afternoon. Can you hear okay. me now? Okay, yeah. uh, yes, that could be another way, but we are also looking into partnering with uh, supermarkets and known uh, supermarkets uh, in the malls. So uh, we are looking for a, a partner who can help us with the refilling station. Actually, this is uh, the long term that we are using. Uh, we are looking for that, uh, for example, a convenience store that uh, has uh, several branches in a city could have could be our partner and be the refilling station. So that's why when you scan the, the QR code in each uh, uh, bottle, you can see the nearest uh, uh, refilling station. What happens after COVID? Um, that's a very good question. Now, no, uh, a lot of people ask us if will, will uh, they still be using this product after COVID. But uh, what we are looking is that uh, the virus will still be here. And as you notice in the news, there are times that there's a surge in some cities. It's because uh, the virus is still there and yet the, the vaccine could have uh, uh, an effect of more than six to a year. And we need to get a booster or another vaccine, just like a flu shot that's happened every year. So when it's not free anymore, we could have another problem coming our way. So we're looking at this as a, a another category for hand wash or hand hand hygiene uh, because so long term use I of have, alcohol. Sorry, I have a, I have another question and this is something that has been puzzling me because apparently COVID is not surface trans transmittable and that was declared. Yet the need for hand hygiene has been going on. So I'm not sure. It's kind of conflicting info on that. Because if it is not surface transmittable, then what's the point of washing and cleaning hands? You might have uh, some more than that. Uh, yes, I've never heard about this as, as of the moment. Uh, as of now, we are we are advised and we are told that uh, it's it's you know contact based, and from the start of uh, the pandemic, this is uh, what we used for research that. Um, to, to, to lessen or minimize the transmission, uh, one way of doing it is uh, washing our hands. Okay. Thank you, Team Prelo. Uh, we will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the video pitch from Team Sure Plus. May we have the video pitch from the team Sure Plus? Good day, everyone. I'm Anjali from Sure Plus. We're a social enterprise startup that aims to achieve zero waste, zero hunger for our country. So many of us are aware that one third of food produced globally is being wasted. However, did you know that one seventh of the world's population also goes hungry? So it's ironic to have both of these problems together at the same time, right? In addition to that, they affect the triple bottom line of people, planet, and profit. So for this complex problem, we come, came up with a comprehensive solution. Enter Surplus, wherein we resell, repurpose, and reallocate surplus food in order to minimize wastage and hunger. So currently, we are reselling surplus produce from farmers via our website and also in our upcoming mobile app, wherein we're also going to sell surplus meals from restaurants and surplus goods from groceries. Then we also repurpose those that are not sold into pastries, chips, juices, and other products. 
and those that are not resold or repurposed are reallocated to our existing feeding programs and upcoming food bank. In this food bank, people will be able to exchange the recyclables for food. So our target market are tech-savvy individuals and businesses who are socially aware, environmentally conscious, as well as looking for more affordable food resources. So we started last 2020 as a project, and currently we're operating a social enterprise. And with our mobile app, we're hoping to start operating as a startup. This is our estimated market size based from similar apps abroad. And our existing main competitors, there's none yet functioning in the Philippines. So this gives um, us an idea that it's viable as an idea, but there's so much potential here in our country. However, to be different from these um, um, apps, we, as we're not just copying them, we have tailor fit our app into applying what is needed here in our country. So through our app, we would be able to match businesses and individuals with surplus food or agricultural wastes to businesses who are able to turn these into other value added products such as fertilizers, eco packaging and biofuel. So these are value propositions to them that will be able to match them to help them through marketing, through reporting their data, and through giving back. These are various marketing strategies that we are going to employ. These are the various revenue streams we can earn from. This is our traction so far. And so what we need are investors or funding so we'll be able to integrate geotagging in our mobile app. And for us, we're able to do marketing and hiring. And we also need mentors and co-founders in order for us to do more. Thank you. That is all. If you're interested to reach out to us, here are our details. Thank you and have a nice day. Thank you, Team Sir. Sure, Blas. Now we will have a question from Sir James. Uh, thanks. A very question to clarify, Mahad. Are you focused on agricultural food waste or on similar yeah. to the one we saw earlier today yeah, in, in the question. session? Yes, yeah. So we actually have a food rescue app on restaurants. Restaurants. But since we started at the start of COVID and many restaurants, um, they started closing down, especially the buffet restaurants where we wanted to rescue surplus food. Um, so we have to be, um, from our studies, the farmers need the help more, especially with the travel restrictions. So there were lots of incidences where in um, transportation was bad. They couldn't bring down their products. So there was lots of surplus. So from that, um, we catered We catered first on surplus food from farmers. And then also with that, we got to realize that aside from food waste, there is um, also like agricultural waste, like 30 to 60% of food waste is not just for meals. It's also from the food processing. So in the process, like for example, fruit peels, et cetera. So these are inevitable biodegradable waste that contribute to um, carbon footprint, to global warming. So we are very problem focused. So instead of focusing on our solution of um, just helping the restaurants, we pivoted to helping the farmers first, but we're still open to catering restaurants and after also surplus from groceries. So with that, um, we'd be able to cater to all of them. So um, in addition to that, also like um, helping the farmers also enabled us to foresee that um, through our platform, we can offer something new that nobody like so far we've known nobody is able to offer yet this is a um, matching um the demand and supply platform so for example um we had um small time smallholder farmers growing oyster mushrooms so these are hard to find and then um there was a coffee shop who had a surplus of coffee grounds like from making coffee so these are really nice um for fertilizer for mushrooms so we got to connect them so it was really nice and from there um we got the idea of doing this also for um another enterprise of making um compost fertilizer organic fertilizer but you know they don't have enough um a food waste on them so we're going to connect them so with this we get to connect like consumers and businesses with surplus food and agricultural waste in order to make these value added products so we're with our platform you would actually be able to support the creation functioning of other businesses or industries so aside from um the compost uh, fertilizer 
the um, uh, eco packaging could also be made through um, surplus uh, like cassava that we have here in Davao City. And then um, also uh, biomass biofuel could be made from biomass. So there's so much um, potential for this, but these businesses are not able to survive or thrive because their need for supply for the raw materials is not being answered. There's no platform uh, matching them yet. So um, yeah, that's um, one thing that makes us different from um, these similar food rescue apps abroad. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, other question, if there's none. Thank you, Tim. I, Tim. I have oh, a question. I'm sorry, sir. Yeah. Uh, you know, I mean, you're operational already, isn't it? You're already kind of running a business. So, um, I mean, you know, this is, this is a hard learning for myself, even when trying to do startups. Uh, in the startup business, doing more usually means less at least in the beginning. So, you know, I mean, you, you have so many things that you can do. And usually that's as a founder, it seems like lowering the risk by doing more things. But in reality, it actually increases the risk. So, you know, I mean, if you had to choose among all the different things you're talking about, which one do you want to choose? And, um, you know, and, and along with that, because each has a different mode of, uh, what do you call uh, transportation? I mean, if you are dealing with something which is a restaurant, that's a local delivery problem. If you are dealing with agriculture, that's a time sensitive uh, remote delivery. While if you are dealing with abaca waste, that's a non time sensitive uh, transportation problem. So, which one do you want to choose and win? Yes, sir. Thank you for that question and advice. Actually, we got that also from our mentors. Um, if you were to choose, uh, we would like to focus on the matching platform because we realized we could also use this in other industries. So with the it... Platform for what? For gathering um, uh, surplus or, or wastes, like, for example, the agricultural wastes, or um, for, because we realized that we could also use this on not just food waste, but for example, plastics. So um, we got uh, involved also with a seller. Um, she's making articrafts from recycled materials, like those sachets or plastics. But despite being wanting to do that, and there's market for it um, for export, she's not able to do so much because she has to pay children to go through rummage, go through garbage and get these plastics in order to make her products. So with this realized that like, um, we could also target like large companies, for example, with uh, packaging problems and then match. Understood. I, sorry, uh, I, I took more time than the others. So thanks for, I got the answer. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, no more questions from the judges. So we would like to thank the team sure blast. Thank, blast. thank you very much. So we will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the video pitch of Team Alipugpug. Our vertical farming system utilizes bamboo as it is abundant in our locality and cheaper, yet provides a big environmental impact on planting high-valued leafy crops. We also automated vertical farming by including sensor, Arduino, water pump, snap solution, and solar panel. Once our sensor detects any changes in pH level and water level, it would automatically send a text message to the farmer. This 6 feet by 10 feet wide vertical farming system provides a total of 420 slots for lettuce.
for the water cycle of our system, we properly designed the flow of the water so that we can ensure that the water will not overflow and the water will also properly distributed in all the bases. We also use a healthy market ecosystem through a digital platform for more convenient market network. Farmers no longer need to worry about the large-scale farmers that controls the market price as we help them sell their goods to a competitive price in the digital market. There's none. Ah, uh, sir, are you? Ask. Uh, so, who who's your target market? Is it you know the farmer farmers that really is doing farming, or are you looking at selling it to you know someone like Diane who has her own you know uh, small farm at home uh, where she goes to relax? Is I mean, who's the target market? The gentleman farmer and gentle lady farmer, or is it? the real farmer thank you so much for your question sir so basically our target market is the small scale farmers in our country so we will focus first in our region which is in davao do so um we will let our we will let the farmers borrow the system and pay an installment scheme for six months then we will sell their produce of the farmers in two ways, which is the business to business and business to customer. Then we will only get 15% commission of the total gross profit and the remaining 85% will be paid back to the par back to the farmers. So basically, we because we want to explore our technology to the small scale farmers, it will help them to develop, especially during this time of pandemic, we will give them a profit or um, we will give them a profit or a business so the answer is you're going to uh, encourage small scale farmers to upgrade their technology of farming and at a very reasonable cost because you're giving them a better system. Uh, that, that's the answer, right? Uh, yes, not sir. really the gentleman farmers, um, but yeah. the real farmers. So basically the farmers or the small scale farmers here in our local is using the traditional method, which is very, uh, it's very... It's very traditional way. So we want to uh, we want to experience our technology to help them to fast their harvest at the same time to to feel the excitement of the of our farmers how technology help them in the daily life. How so will those you are them? because you know once you start scaling, uh, these are mechanical and other equipments, right? So they're going to fail sooner or later. How are you going to support beyond your immediate vicinity um as of this moment so we will partner with the bamboo industry farmers or the bamboo technology the bamboo farmers so we build our own our own product with the help of them or the local bamboo so we use our technology is we use bamboo because it is a very huge and a very uh, there's a lot of bamboo here in our region so we want to to combine the bamboo Farmers at the same time, the small scale farmers focusing on the on focusing on the vegetables areas. So at the same time, we give an impact. So we want to boost their daily life and their household. Okay, and uh, 
you are how are you pricing this how are you going to charge for it uh, you are going to charge for the mechanism and the bamboo farmers will build their own attraction is that how it goes or uh, you're going to assemble everything yourself um it, it, thank you for that sir so basically we during to build our product is we as of this moment we partner with the local farmers the the bamboo farmers so we will we are the one to to help them to combine our own technology then we will integrate this technology we will then we will integrate this bamboo in our technology which is we which is have a, a solar panel and an arduino and a sensor then uh, we are the one to give all the products to the farmers with the help of our of our partners with the SWS said circa and department of agriculture in our region so we are the one to give all the, the all the needs of the farmers like for example the seeds the the nutrients we are the one to give them everything that they need for the farmers is uh, can purchase an alipogpog tax solution so then we are the one to sell their harvest at the end of the month or at the end for as of this moment we are piloting for the lettuce so lettuce can can grow for only a uh, 30 days so after the 30 days we are the one to sell their their harvest to our partnered market through business to business at business to customer at this moment we have a partnered with uh, some restaurant in Davao City and and the way we sell their produce or the way we sell the produce of the farmers is for the business to customer is through our facebook page and mouth of word okay thank you Thank you team Ali Pogpog. Pog. Now, we will proceed to the next finalist. May we have the video pitch of Team Avoda Philippines. Good day. I'm Carol Pizon of Avoda Philippines. In an effort to flatten the curve of the COVID-19 pandemic, we have been forced to come to a standstill. Streets are empty, shops are closed, and people are out of work. Public gatherings have been banned in many places and travel restrictions have been imposed and all of this is having a major impact on the Philippine economy. Numbers of unemployed is soaring. Percentage of businesses that are closed are increasing. Many services have been able to go digital in an effort to continue running their operation such as e-learning, food and grocery de delivery and even live selling. According to Trade Secretary Ramon Lopez, this pandemic has forced all of us to reassess the way we do business, including business models and processes. But there are many who can switch to digital platform and continue functioning. 73% of MSMEs said they need capacity building in digitalizing their services. Our solution? To have a one-stop service app that would help digitalize the whole service industry of this nation. Avoda Functions is a platform for skilled workers, professionals, and service-providing businesses to make their services available to customers, as well as to serve convenience and safety to consumers in meeting their daily and emergency needs. As you can see, we have two target markets, the customers and the service-providing partners. And this is how we're going to earn. We have a 10 peso flat rate as a service charge, 3.5% with a cap of 200 for every transaction. And this, is, and this would be our commission from our service providing partners. We would also earn from our annual subscriptions and advertisements. With 822 providers, 33,000 bookings, and 76 ad advertisement slots, we would meet our break-even point. Avoda is a one-stop service application of almost all known services in a single platform, yet ensures ease of navigation and availment of needed services. Here are some of the services that are already available in our system. Here are the local MSMEs here in Jensen who trusted Avoda in digitalizing their their businesses. We have some testimonials. We have launched in Jensen as our pilot city in July, uh, July this year, and we already have 700 plus subscribers. And this sets us apart from our competitors. And here we are, yours truly. So what do we want? We want collaboration with DTI, DOSD, and D DICT to digitalize the service industry. We want to partner with Telco Company for connectivity for app connectivity and wide reach and we also want we need we also need some fundings for upscaling 
Avad Efficient's digitalizing the whole service industry and aims to be the biggest service providing platform to serve the daily and emergency needs of every person. Digitalization problem, problem solved with Avada. Thank you. Thank you, Avada. We will now proceed with a question and answer. Judges? Um, thank you for that pitch. Um, you've got quite a bit of detail and put some thought into your break even. Um, can you turn that into number of months? How many months down months. in your runway before you for the break, break even? even? Before we reach uh, our break even. Currently, we have um, 200. 221 um, providers, providers so. and uh, the target of 800 is real, would be achieved at least, I think, uh, if we would increase the, the, the cold callers or those who would market our, 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 service. our service to, to SM, MSMEs, then we would be able to, to, to hit the 800 the target. And for the bookings, the, the, for in, if we divide the 333,000, that would just be three bookings in a month or 40 bookings in a year. So that's really a very target, uh, achievable target for, for, the, for the 800. So we just launched, I'm sorry, sir, we just launched in July and, uh, and we are already on the second phase. So we are on the, um, how to say this one, making our service available to the customers. So um, just recently we have uh, less than 50, 50 bookings. So. Do you have data on your um, CAC and things like that? Pardon, customer acquisition sir? cost, lifetime value, things like that. Do we have data? For, for, for building the app, sir? What do you mean? The, for no, if your customers say, so what's your customer acquisition oh, cost? To yes, sir. Use? Yes, sir. Uh, we, we tried to uh, test the market on how we will be promoting the app. Currently, we have, we, we've determined that Google Ads is really a, a, a good platform for, for the installs and um, the, the cost is, would be around 20 to 30 pesos per install. And the challenge currently is to convert those installs to bookings. So we would be needing promotions to offer promotions for, for, to entice the, the, those who install the app to, to, to book in our platform. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mom Diane. You have a question? Man, okay. We would like to thank, like to thank um, Team Avoda Philippines. Thank you. Thank you. We will now proceed to the next finalist. May we have the BG pitch of Team Smart School. LMS, SIS, or SMS. There's a lot of edtech platforms in the Philippines that are available in the market for more than five years now. But why is that with all of these options that public schools can choose from, most of them still prefer it to manually manage students or schools even in this time of crisis. Now, is it about the lack of devices? No, because according to DepEd, 93% of schools in the Philippines have devices ready for online learnings. You see, there are four main problems here. First is the interface. Most of them, especially for parents, they are not tech savvy. Accessibility. Majority of schools in the Philippines are having trouble with this internet connection. Cost efficiency. Most of the public school students and also for teachers doesn't have enough allowance to purchase load every single day just to get access to that platform. And lastly, engagement. Yes, they may have the portal, but are they using it frequently? No, because it gives them more burden instead of convenience. Now, this is where Cleverly comes in because Cleverly is a gamified LMS where teachers and students can access without, without worrying their internet connection. Because with Cleverly, students can now answer their quizzes and study their modules anytime and even if they're offline. And also, they will receive an SMS notification every time the teachers uploaded new homework, new learning materials, or quizzes on our platform. And lastly, Cleverly is gamified, where students can earn points according to their academic performance, such as submitting new homework, getting perfect in exam, or perfect in attendance. With this, it encourages them to study hard to redeem more points and get bigger prices. Now, Cleverly is free, but for us to generate revenue, we will release our premium version, which is a subscription per teacher per month. Now, with this premium version, it has five more offline and advanced features on our platform. 
Now, under Cleverly, we have two running apps currently. First is Scanit, where we already have one of 16 public schools in the division of Sir Golden Norte, and also Smart School, where we already have 1,500 active users on our platform under the Ganito National High School. Now, with this two traction, we can use this to easily promote, introduce, or market our new solutions to our target market. Now, if we win this challenge, 55% of the grant will go to product development, and 25% will go to marketing, and 20% will go to miscellaneous costs. You see, Cleverly is not just about digitizing every public school in the Philippines, but also by bringing improvements that would push education to be more progressive. Join us as we help every public school in the Philippines transition to digitization with ease, starting here in Caraga region. Thank you. Thank you very much. Smart school. Judges, you have questions? Tima, uh, Sir Aro. Hi. Uh, so the content basically, uh, con how do you see this? Continuing after COVID when, you know, teachers get busy doing it the old way at school. Okay, great. So uh, basically, Cleverly is first designed for face-to-face. -face, but uh, we thought that the face-to-face -face will be back in the school year. That's why uh, we added a couple of features for blended, uh, distance learning. And that's why we wanted to take advantage of the uh, remaining schools that, uh, that are now is still in the distance learning. And also... Uh, for face-to-face, -face, this is where we, our premium version comes in because it has a classroom attendance where it will send SMS to parents. And also, uh, this will benefit teachers to um, you know, easily generate reports such as attendance or the uh, checking the quizzes of their students. This will save them time and get more time on focusing on, on delivering uh, learning materials to their students in face-to-face -face classes. So I, have, I have a connected question. Uh... Who will pay for it? Because uh, I think you're kind, kind of working with uh, mostly public schools. And obviously, the public schools do not have a budget for this. So uh, is your target market going to be um, DepEd? Or how, how are you looking at it? Or is it the private schools? OK, so yeah, um, uh, the way we uh, propose this to public schools is the uh, first is to introduce this to uh, district and to LGO. So right now we already partnered to our district, which is around 14 public schools, and they are now joining for our early adapters this coming 2022. And uh, the payment will go to parents because oh sorry uh, for the teachers uh, instead of students because students doesn't have in uh, uh, e wallet or uh, credit cards to pay online. So uh, we'll go to teachers. Uh, they but will be the one who will. Why the teachers spend money? Uh, I mean. You know, uh, I guess the only one logically who might spend money is going to be the LGU. Yes. Yes. So basically, that's the other, uh, the other option for schools. So after presenting this to public schools, uh, they will help us to propose this to LGU for the so that the LGU will LGU will, LGU will um, uh, create a budget for our platform to be implemented in their schools in their municipality. And have, uh, how is it so far? Are they looking at benefit of it? Do they want it? Okay, so yeah, so the way we validate this platform is we first introduce this to the public schools that are not planning to transform to digitization. And after, after presenting this, uh, they change their mind and they are now willing to you know, uh, adapt to the new normal. And in that way, we finally uh, see the demand for this platform to the schools that are uh, already planning for adapting to the new normal. So yeah, um, they've been looking for this solution for when I was a high school student yet, that was uh, around three years ago. And until now, there's no still a platform that is willing to uh, serve the underserved sector, which is the public schools. Okay, thank you very much. Team Smart School. So I'd just like to ask, is here 
Okay, if the team biofield is not here, in that case, the team smart school is our last team. And that concludes the final teaching session for the professional category of Philippine Startup Challenge 2021. So how was it, everyone? So you already have your list of winners. But before that, we'll now open the breakout room for our judges and chosen staff for their deliberation. May I ask the technical team to transfer the judges to the breakout room. Thank you. The finalists have gone through other pitching sessions to be finally competing here at the national finals. For our 25 finalists or 25 startup teams, I would like to already congratulate all of you. Not all may win in this afternoon competition, but I hope to see each one of you thriving soon. Remember to, leave, to believe in your potential and always work hard to improve your startup. You reach the national finals for a reason. As we wait for the result, let's have Ms. Carrie Buenape of Huawei Philippines to share the prizes for our winners. will receive additional cloud voucher so the, the top winner will get 30,000 worth of cloud vouchers the second place will take home 20,000 worth of cloud vouchers the third place 10,000 uh, dollars uh, worth of cloud vouchers the fourth place six thousand US dollars worth of cloud voucher and the fifth place is four thousand uh, cloud voucher and unfortunately this is not convertible to cash Aside, Aside from, from that, that uh, the, the winning team, team will also win uh, some prizes from Huawei and the chance to uh, take some lessons from our HCI or HCIP uh, Huawei ICT Academy. And then, uh, yeah. So can we move the slide so that we, we, they can further see what's in store for them? So the cloud voucher, as I've mentioned, already given to all the participants today. So this is an initial seeding of 1,500 where they can use it uh, to further amplify their apps. Uh, slide, please. Okay, and then uh, we are also offering a virtual hall tour of our exhibition hall. So we have several exhibition halls. So this one is the Darwin Exhibition Hall, uh, which is more focused on uh, biodiversity, uh, ICT industry prosperity, technical support. So it would be fun to, to view this virtually as well. Slide, please. We also have our Columbus Exhibition Hall, which focuses on digital transformation for various industries. So you can see examples here of the immersive technology that has been developed. So there are cutting edge technologies such as cloud, cloud computing, AI. Uh, and as, as we've said, let's all explore the unknown together. Uh, using the technologies developed here, particularly focusing on STEAM, electrical in the information area. Slide, please. So, and lastly, we have Galileo uh, Hall, which is a fo actually focused on uh, all about 5G. So, we have a lot of examples here on the use of 5G in industry and in education uh, and also recreation. So, this is one of the exhibition halls that we're offering for you to tour and to learn. Slide, please. And uh, as we have mentioned, we are also offering a free training for Huawei mobile service. So we we offer the you know four pillars of uh, the development, HMS development, which is number one, uh, 
HMS score. And then we all will also be offering the App Gallery Connect where you can develop, distribute, operate, and uh, analyze and do your innovation. And then we also have our Code Lab, which opens to you our tutorial on HMS kits, hands-on coding experience, and demo codes. And then we also have our developer forum where you can interact with the community, ask questions, engage with other students and developers across the globe. Slide, please. Okay, so how long will that take? So if you uh, are interested to take the course, we offer five weeks intensive training, but it's only two hours per week. So here we have the week one, the introduction week two. So it's not going to take much of your time. So since everybody now is uh, going online, all the courses are also offered online. So slide, please. So as mentioned, uh, we are awarding additional cloud vouchers to the top winners. So uh, ranging from the first price 30,000 to the fifth place at 4,000 US dollars worth of cloud voucher coupons. Slide please. And then for the champion team, uh, we will also be awarding one for each member of the team, a brand new Huawei display 8080 23.8 inch monitor to amplify their experience while they're coding or developing their app. Slide, please. And lastly, we are also offering the Huawei Band 6. So for all the for, for the champion team, for all the members of the champion team, so that they can also check their health because as they say, especially now, health is wealth. So that's it, guys. So congratulations to our winners and to those who will receive our prize. Thank you. Thank you very much, very much, Ma'am Carrie. Thank you, Ma'am Juvi. We also would like to thank Huawei Philippines. No, a lot is really being given to our winners to award and acknowledge their innovation. It's very exciting to see how far our winners will go. Uh, will go after the support of the Philippine Startup Challenge. Um, as the deliberation is yet to end, let us stand by and wait for a few minutes. We will be playing a video while we're waiting for the results. This is Brittany. She's been tasked with producing the company's next big event. Happening in just a few weeks. The event technology options are seemingly endless. Until she found the perfect platform to engage and delight attendees. This is Excel Events, a virtual and hybrid events platform that has all of your must-have features in one place. From connecting attendees to brand exhibitors, seamless networking functionality, and custom ticketing options, you can manage the event ecosystem all from one place. Stream your live videos right on the platform or integrate your favorite streaming provider so speakers can focus on delivering their message while event managers are confident about delivering their run of show. Attendees can have direct access to speakers using built-in chat features. They can have one-on-one -on -one sessions with speakers or other attendees to create an intimate networking setting. Attendees are able to connect to multiple live sessions without ever leaving the platform. Create better events with flexible agendas. Native live streaming. In-depth analytics. lead gen management, multiple concurrent session functionality, integration with popular software solutions. Learn more about Excel.
Excel Events by visiting ExcelEvents.com. Try it for free today and change the way you see events. Your customers have bills to pay, essentials to buy, and services to hire. Make it secure, reliable, and hassle-free for them with PayMaya. PayMaya's payment solutions have you covered because now you can accept all kinds of cashless payments any way you do business, whether it's in-store, delivery, via mobile app, on your website, or even without a website. Plus, you can monitor your business growth on a single dashboard. Nandoon ka at my lowest. Nung isa-isa na wala mga customers ko. Nung akala ko, pasara na shop ko. You gave me hope when all seemed dark and when I was lost. You encouraged me to look beyond, to go beyond, to focus on my family, friends, and blessings despite it all. Lahat yun na itawid ko kasi nandyan ka sa tabi ko. Nagpapaalala na kaya ko. So ngayon dahil sa'yo, mas matapang na ako to face any challenge. And now I realize what matters most. So thank you. Thank you for being there for me through everything. Nagbago ba ng mundo? Alam ko, kaya ko naharapin ang araw-araw na walang takot. Kasi you are just right by my side. And I can always count on you. Kaya salamat, ikaw talaga ang BFF ko. Filipinos have struggled with the most essential facets of life, like health, education, livelihood, managing finances, and many more. Our country needs all the help it can get to manage its burden. We want to maximize digital technology to provide solutions for real customer pain points. This is how 917 Ventures came to life. The Philippines' largest corporate venture builder, we ideate, launch, accelerate and scale new business ideas that have the potential to grow fast. Through our portfolio companies, we empower consumers and businesses to power through and emerge stronger every day, pandemic or not. Our vision at GCash is finance for all. Beyond financial services, GCash has become a super live app with over 51 million registered users. Consulta MD is the largest telehealth company in the Philippines with over a million users. HealthNow is an integrator platform that brings health and care to every Filipino in one tap at the comfort of your homes. With these healthcare solutions, Filipinos now have access to doctors 24-7 and get their medicines delivered on the same day. And as we all strive to search for safer ways to go about our days, we understand how customers are starting to rely on online grocery shopping for their daily essentials. This is where Pure Go comes in. Pure Go has become one of Metro Manila's top of mind grocery delivery services with its best priced grocery items from trusted brands. Sparking a difference on ad tech, digital media, and creatives that helps brands create more meaningful connections with their customers by leveraging data and prioritizing the power of insights. We at Rush offer an out-of-the-box solution that helps businesses start their digital transformation in the most cost-effective manner. Rush and AdSparks marketing, loyalty programs, and e-commerce solutions help future-proof businesses prepare them for the surge of online shopping and transactions, and find their footing in the digital world. 917 Ventures continues to offer innovative solutions with the addition of two more portfolio companies. Enkiro, with its suite of artificial intelligence-powered products, and M360 with its multi-channel communication services. Our secret? We innovate for the people, not the prestige. We ideate opportunities, launch solutions, accelerate lives. We are committed to build more ventures to further accelerate the country's digital transformation. The future is now. The future is us. We are 917 Ventures.
Multisys Technologies Corporation is your one-stop system provider. We do advanced systems research and development, focus on evolving assets of IT systems, platforms, and software solutions. We show integrated set of programs and solutions that drive businesses nowadays. Backed by our R&D team, we are able to customize solutions according to your business requirements with speed, accuracy, and efficiency. In our efforts to help Filipinos' way of life through digital innovations and transformation, we partnered with IT companies, system contractors, government agencies, big conglomerates, small and medium enterprises, and tech startups as well. We go above and beyond partnerships. It's a teamwork and we make sure that your business and ours grow together. We find success in every collaboration and establish meaningful connections. That's why we want to partner with you. Here at Multisys, we empower your business. Multisys is a one-stop software company. So instead of you talking to too many integrators, we'll be able to come up with a centralized and automated way of doing things. We have a team that really move like one. So they are really united. So instead of one programmer, one system approach, I think multiple programmers joining force together, they can collaborate easily. We have speed, we have accuracy, we have efficiency. I think that's the secret of the group. That's why companies love to work with us. It will be faster for them. It will be more efficient to develop and deploy a certain system. They are a designer, they are a coder or programmer, they are a systems analyst, they are a quality control expert, and they're a UI and UX expert as well. That skill is not easy to really somehow have in one program. Multisys can really customize the system. We can customize it according to their needs, design for their own and existing process flows. We're all racing against the clock. The priority of Multisys is to elevate the lifestyle of every Filipino by delivering automated, integrated systems to make sure that we can fast-track the operation, processes. Yeah. I think it's all about how fast can you deliver a certain technology. Speed matters nowadays. Sabi nga sa Tagalog, diba, daig ng maagap ang masipag. That's why we develop futuristic systems. What we do is that we predict the future, we develop, and then the moment that we are partnered with a certain entity, we're able to show them a live system. It's not a PowerPoint presentation. It will be a prototype, it will be a working system. So this will give them an idea how to solve a problem. This will give them an idea to expedite their processes. So not only showing them a vision, but showing them a solution already. We develop end-to-end -end solutions for eight industries now and we would like to automate other industries as well. Currently, we have an end-to-end -end solution for information technology businesses, okay, ERPs. Uh, we have e-government solutions, healthcare, an end-to-end -end solution for utility, whether you are an electric company, a water utility company, a telco, or a uh, cable utility company. We do also retail, hospitality, academe, and of course, uh, the new one is the banking and finance. Here at Multisys, we empower your business. And one of my big dreams is to be part of creating 10 million meaningful careers here in the Philippines in the next 30 years. How do we get there? I believe it's gonna take a big shift in our culture, and mindset plus an acceleration of the growth of our local ecosystem to give more Filipinos the freedom to grow and flourish as entrepreneurs and more specifically to grow as whole life leaders who will have the character, community, and the competency to solve seemingly impossible problems here in the Philippines with ventures 
that are going to transform culture and communities all around the globe in our lifetime. serial entrepreneur based in Manila, Philippines. I've gathered a formidable cast of business and industry leaders looking to fund and support the country's post-pandemic solutions. Dennis Anthony Uy, co-founder and CEO of Converge ICT Solutions. David Almirol Jr., founder and CEO of Multisys Technologies. Rose Ong, senior executive vice president and COO of Wellcom Depot. Bernard D., Visionary Mayor of Kauaian City, Isabella, and Jay Villarante, Chairman and CEO of 8 Ventures. Our goal is to find and support the new breed of heroes taking on the challenges of a post-pandemic future. Many will try, but only a few will make it to the final pitch. Calling all small business owners, meet Communicart. A Rappler-led initiative where small businesses can advertise on Rappler's platforms at affordable rates. Get featured on our socials or through a listicle. How about an article? Let Rappler's discerning audience know about your business. Email us at communicart at rappler.com for more information. QBO? QBO? It actually just stands for Kubo, as in the Bahai Kubo. And yes, we do have our very own Bahai Kubo in our office. Just like the Bahai Kubo, we stand for Bayanihan or Teamwork. Kubo is a place where the community can come together to help ideas flourish, showcase Filipino innovation, and build great companies. Filipino startups changing the world. That's our vision. We believe in building a globally competitive startup ecosystem right here in the Philippines. I mean, it's about time, isn't it? But how do we do it? Let's ask Kubo President. Kubo is the country's first venture at a physical space to help the startup ecosystem. It's a public-private sector partnership between J.P. Morgan Chase Foundation, Ideaspace Foundation, the Department of Trade and Industry, and the Department of Science and Technology. Wait, wait, wait. Did you say public sector? The government? In the Philippines? Yeah, and they're very supportive. We're proud to have them as a partner. We hope to inspire Filipinos to come and join and be part of this ecosystem and we want to bring their dreams to reality. In the end, it's going to help themselves, it's going to help their employees, it will help this country. What do we actually do? Well, we do this, this, Seriously, that was so tiring. But you're missing one more thing. You also do this, the JP Morgan Incubation Program. Kubo picks the top startups from all over the Philippines to be part of the incubation program, where they will receive dedicated mentorship, advanced professional services, curated workshops, and assistance to exiting. External party involvements include government agencies, 
the Philippine Stock Exchange, and major investors. There's a potential for global exposure as well. Wow, we do a lot, don't we? Yes, it's actually as simple as encourage key collaboration, develop the community, and provide incubation. Oh gosh, we're so culet! <laughs> so, if you are interested to join our events or be part of any of our programs catered to startup development, all you have to do is sign up! Sign up! Sign up! Sign up! Sign up! Sign up. And together, let's build the Philippine Startup Community! This is Brittany. She's been tasked with producing the company's next big event. Happening in just a few weeks. The event technology options are seemingly endless. Until she found the perfect platform to engage and delight attendees. This is Excel Events a virtual and hybrid events platform that has all of your must-have features in one place. From connecting attendees to brand exhibitors, seamless networking functionality, and custom ticketing options, you can manage the event ecosystem all from one place. Stream your live videos right on the platform, or integrate your favorite streaming provider so speakers can focus on delivering their message, while event managers are confident about delivering their run of show. Attendees can have direct access to speakers using built-in chat features. They can have one-on-one -on -one sessions with speakers or other attendees to create an intimate networking setting. Attendees are able to connect to multiple live sessions without ever leaving the platform. Create better events with flexible agendas. Native live streaming. In-depth analytics. Lead gen management. Multiple concurrent session functionality. Integration with popular software solutions. Learn more about Excel Events by visiting excelevents.com. Try it for free today and change the way you see events. Your customers have bills to pay, essentials to buy, and services to hire. Make it secure, reliable, and hassle-free for them with PayMaya. PayMaya's payment solutions have you covered because now you can accept all kinds of cashless payments any way you do business, whether it's in-store, delivery, via mobile app, on your website, or even without a website. Plus, you can monitor your business growth on a single dashboard. Nandoon ka at my lowest. Nung isa-isa na wala mga customers ko. Nung akala ko, pasara na shop ko. You gave me hope when all seemed dark and when I was lost. You encouraged me to look beyond, to go beyond, to focus on my family, friends, and blessings despite it all. Lahat yun, Naitawid ko, kasi nandyan ka sa tabi ko, nagpapaalala na kaya ko. So ngayon dahil sa'yo, mas matapang na ako to face any challenge. And now I realize what matters most. So thank you. Thank you for being there for me through everything. Nagbago ba ng mundo? Alam ko, kaya ko naharapin ang araw-araw na walang takot. Kasi you are just right by my side. And I can always count on you. Kaya salamat, ikaw talaga ang BFF ko.
Filipinos have struggled with the most essential facets of life, like health, education, livelihood, managing finances, and many more. Our country needs all the help it can get to manage its burden. We want to maximize digital technology to provide solutions for real customer pain points. This is how 917 Ventures came to life. The Philippines' largest corporate venture builder. We ideate, launch, accelerate, and scale new business ideas that have the potential to grow fast. Through our portfolio companies, we empower consumers and businesses to power through and emerge stronger every day, pandemic or not. Our vision at GCash is finance for all. Beyond financial services, GCash has become a super live app with over 51 million registered users. Consulta MD is the largest telehealth company in the Philippines with over a million users. HealthNow is an integrator platform that brings health and care to every Filipino in one tap at the comfort of your homes. With these healthcare solutions, Filipinos now have access to doctors 24-7 and get their medicines delivered on the same day. And as we all strive to search for safer ways to go about our days, we understand how customers are starting to rely on online grocery shopping for their daily essentials. This is where Pure Go comes in. Pure Go has become one of Metro Manila's top of mind grocery delivery services with its best priced grocery items from trusted brands. Sparking a difference on ad tech, digital media, and creatives that helps brands create more meaningful connections with their customers by leveraging data and prioritizing the power of insights. We at Rush offer an out-of-the-box solution that helps businesses start their digital transformation in the most cost-effective manner. Rush and AdSparks Marketing, loyalty programs, and e-commerce solutions help future-proof businesses prepare them for the surge of online shopping and transactions, and find their footing in the digital world. 917 Ventures continues to offer innovative solutions with the addition of two more portfolio companies. Enkiro, with its suite of artificial intelligence-powered products, and M360 with its multi-channel communication services. Our secret? We innovate for the people, not the prestige. We ideate opportunities, launch solutions, accelerate lives. We are committed to build more ventures to further accelerate the country's digital transformation. The future is now. The future is us. We are 917 Ventures. Ma'am, nakamute ka, ma'am. I'm sorry. The time has come to announce the result of the competition. It's going to be a heart-pounding moment for our top 25 finalists. And now, may we ask the judges and Director Emmy to present the top five winners. Philippine Startup Grant Fund for the DICT. So don't lose hope because, you know, DICT, DOST, and DTI have a lot of other um, opportunities for you, waiting for you. Just have to take advantage of those. Okay, so now, uh, as we said, all the good things come to an end. <laughs> we have here now the top five winners who will actually receive uh, trophies and the prizes from uh, Miss Carrie from Maui. Thank you, Miss Carrie, for always supporting PSC. 
and of course those who will be eligible for that for the DICT startup grant fund. Now um, I have the pleasure of announcing the fifth place um, winner. Okay, so where's the drum roll now? I thought there's a drum roll. <laughs> okay, so for the fifth placer, okay, so we have, uh, you saw it already. So it's. Okay. Congratulations. Smile. Three, two, one. Smile. Thank you. Congratulations. Sir Aru, for the... Is it time for okay. the next one? Okay. So let me... I'll be the one to announce the fourth place winner. And is there going to be a drum roll or I just go with it? Okay, so I guess we lost the drum somewhere. Um, so the one that is going to be on the fourth place is the Uproot Urban Farms. It's a startup that creates, that creates impact by harnessing the power of soilless farming and control environment agriculture. Congratulations, guys. Okay, may I request the uh, fourth placer team for the photo off? Kindly on your camera, please. Cameras, please. Okay, at the count of three one, two, three, smile. Okay. Thank you. Congratulations, guys. Good luck. Congratulations. Fantastic. And, and now, now may I call on Sir James for the third place? Thank you. We're moving on to third place for the professional category. And you could all bang on your desks at home to do a drum roll. But the winner is... Lift. So Team Lift, that's a startup that created a multifunctional, portable, portable, modular and scalable training equipment to address the needs of flight instructors, avian educators and student pilots. Congratulations. Congratulations, Team Lift. May we request to on your cameras to have a photo off with the judges and director Emmy. Okay. After three, one, two, three, smile. Okay, thank you. thank you. For the second place, we have Mom Diane to announce the second place. The second place goes to... Okay, we left the drum in the breakout room. Congratulations to team... Shall we hear it? We're going to flash it on the screen. Oh, someone's getting the drum in the breakout room. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Are we ready to flash it on screen? Uh, the team that gets to the second place, that got to the second place, is team. Shall I say it? Erin. Erin. Startup for farmers that provides a centralized irrigation and fertilization solution with data driven decision support and monitoring platform with self diagnostic capability. Congratulations, Team Erin. Congratulations. May I request the Team Erin to on their cameras with the judges and director Emmy and Mom Kari? I'm sorry. Can you please okay. include my. 
another thirty member, okay. Daniel Labadan. Thank you. All the way from Region Two. Yeah. Is she in already, ma'am? Okay. After three. Uh, she's not. Uh, she's I not on the screen yet, po. What's her name? Uh, Daniela Labadan, po. Daniela Badan. Daniela Badan. Okay. Give a moment for the tech team to yeah. include Sir Danielle. Thank you. Okay. After three. Okay. One, two, three. Smile. Okay. Thank you. And now, <laughs> Director Emmy. Okay, wala pa ring drum roll. Okay. <laughs> so, now for our grand winner for the first place of the Philippines Startup Challenge 21. Let's call on <laughs> drum rolls the breakout group. Let's call on team Farmbox. Box. Congratulations to Team Farmbox. So Farmbox is a startup helping farmers in Batangas. They provide assistance of supplies to the farmers and help them market their produce to enterprise. So congratulations to Farmbox. Okay, we would like to request the Farmbox team to on their cameras as they are our winner for 2021 professional category of Philippine Startup Challenge 2021. <laughs> okay, smile after three. One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Congratulations. Congrats. Congrats. And thank you so much to our judges. Thank you for staying. And Miss Gary, thank you. <laughs> oh, okay. What an exciting moment for our finalists and winners. Congratulations, everyone. Thank you to all our judges. And now we know the winners of the Philippine Startup Challenge 2021 professional category. These teams were really presented an exemplary pitch waiting only to be further supported. So what does everyone think? Do you think your team win or won but before we conclude the competition let us welcome the DICT's assistant secretary for digital capability and transformation ASEC Alvin Navarro is a reliable official who facilitates the mission of deliveries DICT's three bureaus in charge of training industry development and government digital transformation let us now welcome him as he delivers the closing remarks Good evening. On behalf of the Department of Information and Communications Technology, I would like to commend all 25 teams who have made it to the finals today. All of you are winners for pushing forward and making it this far. We encourage each and every one of you to persevere, continue to innovate, and to contribute in your own meaningful ways to society. To the top five winners, congratulations for winning the first iteration of the Philippine Startup Challenge 2021 for professionals. All of you are eligible to be the first batch of startups to receive the startup grant of DICT. This will jumpstart one of the main components of the digital startup development and acceleration, acceleration program or DSP, DAP. To our esteemed judges, we are grateful for your time. By sharing your wisdom and expertise, you have made this competition much more meaningful. We hope that you will continue to work with DICT and its startup program. To our program community partners, thank you for support or for the support you have extended to DICT for the implementation of this year's PSC from start to finish. All the mentorships, trainings, resource personnel provided 
prices for PSC and other various assistance offered played a key role in making this event a success. To our regional cluster officers, many thanks for the successful implementation of the regional pitching competitions. And to the ICT Industry Development Bureau, congratulations for another successful event. The DICT, as one of the drivers of the Innovative Startup Act, has been working closely with the DOST and DTI to create powerful programs for the Philippine startup ecosystem. The ICT over the years have launched several programs catering to grassroots and the countryside. The Philippine Startup Challenge is one of the results. The competition started back in 2014 when the DICT was formerly called the DOST ICTO. At its core, the competition aims to encourage and support Filipinos in creating innovative and relevant ICT products and services that may potentially develop into viable business ventures, as well as solve social problems. As I mentioned this morning, this was one of the key drivers for pushing the spirit of entrepreneurship for every Filipino. Now on its sixth run, the competition not only caters additionally to professional categories, but also incorporates the DICT Startup Grant Fund. With the success of the professional category, we look forward to the student category of the Philippine Startup Challenge 2021. The deadline of submission is towards the end of the year. We encourage students all over the country to participate and showcase your innovative ideas. Everything begins by fostering the proper mindset. Let us all partake in the continuous digital transformation happening across the world. Again, I congratulate all finalists and winners, the DICT, as well as the Philippine startup community will be your staunchest ally to support you on your innovative startup endeavors. We hope to see everyone again for the seventh Philippine Startup Challenge. Have a safe and blessed day. Maraming salamat po sa inyo. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Asik Alvin. And that's conclude this year Philippine Startup Challenge. Congratulations to every startup teams who participated today. And I hope this will not be the last time we'll we'll see you. Thank you for tuning in. Again, this is Juvi Manlapas, your host, and would like to thank you for being with us at the national finals for the professional category of the Philippine Startup Challenge 2021. Before I end, always remember to be kind and grateful. Good evening and stay safe.